right, let's get to it as we got another big radio show tonight. The Crypto Guru heads us into the weekend talking some werewolves, dogmen, monsters, and everything in between. If you have never heard the Crypto Guru on this show, my God, are you missing out. Ronald L. Murphy Jr., a.k.a. the Crypto Guru. I nicknamed him. I nicknamed him, and I'm taking credit for that. And I know Ron always tells people that, too. So, hello, the gorgeous and talented Emily Bigelow, <laughs> a.k.a. Alaska's greatest athlete for taking home the gold medal tonight. Race fan is in silver with a bronze medal from Sweden, Magnus Vermagnuson. Cosmic Fleur looking lovely tonight. Steam Train Mark in Australia. How's tomorrow looking? Please update us to let me know if I am alive in the future. Jesse Pacheco. Welcome to Spaced Out Radio's chat room. The gorgeous Steph Dickey, uh, Jack Clark, Grand Paul, that's your new name, Grand Paul Holland. Yes, Chad Smith, how you doing? Snakes, good to see you. Sultry Susie, nice to have you here. Mennonite Abe, thanks for joining us. The gorgeous Jenny Metz is here. Michael Smith kicking off the super chat tonight. Thank you, Michael. Really appreciate it. By the way, Michael will be signing autographs after the show Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Jeff Bridges, welcome. Gorgeous Renee, Dirty Filth, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate that. Mmm, looking lovely tonight. Mmm, we'll be signing autographs only in gold Sharpie pen. Line up to the left. So you have Michael on the right. You got mmm on the left, both signing autographs. And yes, uh, we are doing just fine right now. Little Marky Spender is here, everyone. Little Marky Spender. Yeah, that's my friend who says he'll shoot me in the leg if we get chased down by a grizzly bear. And that, that's a good friend right there. Only a good friend does that. That's right. I hope Baxter's watching. Hi, Baxter. Anyways, uh, gorgeous Gary is here. There he is, everyone. John Swan, Mama Susan, Jeffrey DeRuin, Double Tim. Good to have all of you here. Thanks for joining us. All right. There is the gorgeous and talented Heather McGuire. McGuire? Where the hell did I get McGuire from? Heather McIntyre. Yes, she is the one who turns the lights on in Vegas. She is that gorgeous. Stephen Edmond, welcome to the show. And Walter Sobchak, Jeremy Jones, good to see you here. Uh, Steam Train Mark has officially updated us. We are alive tomorrow. Thank you. Appreciate that. Oumuamua, Millennium, Andrew, how you doing? Hope you're driving safe, Andrew. Please let us know. Richard Elmore, good to see you, my friend. Triple M, Mr. Man, Mr., good to see you. Uh, the gorgeous Jenny White Bear has arrived. And uh, let's see, who else is here? Solar Warden. M. Coons, it's been a while. How you doing, man? Good to see you. Nicola, good to see you. My good friend, Jose Magina, how are you? 5900 buck. Uh, Apollo 11. Yes, nice to see you. Hey, Fabster, you beautiful bastard. How are you? The gorgeous and talented Jennifer P. has returned. The lovely Christy Bergeron is here. Nicholas Nicholas Shaughnessy, thanks for coming on out, man. Appreciate you. Uh, where am I here? I've lost my way in the chat room again. Uh, Beyond the Edge Radio, uh, that's Eric Altman right there, everyone. Yeah. Hey, Eric Altman, he will be a guest in August Yes, if you, you'll love Eric Altman. One of the really great dudes in crypto uh, world uh, in the East Coast. He's out of Pennsylvania. Sinister Vax, how are you? Sasquatch, nice to see you. Awesome Annie Svensson, YJ, good to see you. Jim Nicholas, thanks for coming on in. Go 66, boo, to you. And uh, where, where else are we here? Uh, oh, Murray F., thank you so much for that super chat, man. Really appreciate that, Murray. Really thank you so much for your continued support of Spaced Out Radio. Always appreciate it. Ronnie on Twitter. How are you, gorgeous Ronnie? And uh, Mondak, nice to see you. Philip Baca, good to have you here, my friend. Thank you for joining us. As we are uh, just a little bit away here. Uh, why is that not working? Number lock. Let's try that one. There we go. All right. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. And Bassmaster, good to see you. Mark Ellen, Sherry Knight, looking lovely. 
Uh, Coach Clearfloss, good to see you. Spookles the cat. She is the best cat going right now. She is. She's amazing. And uh, we are officially caught up right now. I'm going to give you a little sneak peek here. There he is, everyone, the crypto guru. And there he is. We are 15 seconds away. Super Chat is a great way to support what we do on a nightly basis on this show. Hi, John Hudson. We'll get to his UFO report later on. Grandmaster Joshua, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Let's rock and roll right now. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. You know, usually I have a big paragraph written for my guest tonight, but there's only one way to introduce the man tonight, the crypto guru. (laughs) Enough said right there. Ronald L. Murphy Jr. is literally one of the greatest writers when it comes to everything cryptid and paranormal. If you don't believe me, go on Amazon, check out Ronald L. Murphy Jr., and get one of his books. He is eloquent. He is romantic in his way that he is able to bring passion to the stories of monsters, legends, folklore, everything from werewolves to dogman and every ghost and alien in between. And I'll tell you, he is one of my best friends in this field. I can honestly say that because I mean it. And anytime he wants to come on this show, damn it, we got time for him because he's just that guy. Crypto guru. My friend, I bow to you once again. Well, no, I, I hope I live up to that, Dave. Uh, you and I have had a great relationship now for, look, I don't know how long you've been on the air now. It's been, what, six years? Seven? No, no, no. What? Six years. Six, six and years. And a half years. That's what it is. Yeah. So we have been together since the very beginning. And uh, whenever I was up and coming and uh, you gave me the moniker of the crypto guru, and I've had it ever since. And uh, if it was not for Space Out Radio, I would not be... Uh, I would not be where I am at today, and I, and I and I tell you that with all sincerity. Well, you're way too kind to us, my friend, and and I mean that. Anybody who uh, has heard of you, talked to you, met you, read your books will always say to the uh, everybody, you know, that Ron is literally one of the best. You have one of the greatest reputations out there in the cryptid world, someone who is very no-nonsense, someone who loves to tell a good story and and a research story. It's not just a bunch of BS that you're making up because you heard it uh, fifth hand, not second hand, but fifth hand. But you're that guy. And and what brings your passion to these topics? Um, You know, I I think that it's, it goes back to my childhood. It goes back to the way I was raised. Um, You know, my mother was very much into this kind of stuff. Uh, this being a uh, Friday night, this would be, uh, you know, whenever I was back in uh, elementary school, this will be the time that uh, I would start getting my sleep for the weekend because my mom and I will be watching horror movies all night long on Saturday. And, you know, these are the tame ones. These aren't your slasher movies. This was, you know, your typical hammer horror movies from England. Uh, some good, you know, good quality stuff there. Um, but we would also watch things like The Legend of Boggy Creek that was coming out at that time, too, in the mid-70s. And then uh, we would watch, you know, uh, In Search Of. It was just a good time to be alive. Um, But uh, one of the things I had going for me whenever I was younger as well, too, is that in my area of western Pennsylvania, it became a hotspot for UFO and Bigfoot sightings. And we had people like, uh, you know, the godfather 
of, uh, of uh, cryptozoology here in Western Pennsylvania, Stan Gordon. He would be on the radio from Pittsburgh about, you know, once a month talking about uh, uh, encounters that were occurring around where I lived. And my mom and I would take, uh, or my mom would take my brother and I out the next day. We would go looking for the places where these aliens and these Bigfoot were sighted. So it was a great time to be a kid. And, you know, even though I grew up and, you know, I went to college and everything, this, this quest for the other has always been with me. You know, I, I'm trying to illuminate the shadows uh, that are outside my window for the benefit of myself. And if other people were along for the ride, even better. For you, as you have kind of gone on this journey on your own, it's been a long journey. It's been a tough journey. You've had a lot of personal issues that have come up. You became a single dad in this journey early on uh, of five children, mm -hmm. and you've done an incredible job with your kids. You now are, are a grandfather of a beautiful young little lady who uh, I'm sure has your heart wrapped around her at like a blanket. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, I mean, the way you have handled things and the ups and downs and, and everything on a personal level, you've never let it hurt your professionalism and, and you're writing for these topics. And, and I know what it's like with one child to be a, a single father, but to have five, I wouldn't know what that's like, but I'll tell you, man, for you, I, I, I just commend that you have, have uh, faced the demons uh, straight through and you've uh, you've won, and you're somebody out there who who commands that respect because you give respect back. Well, you know what, I appreciate that, Dave, because one of the biggest compliments that I could have is uh, you know is being a father because you only get one shot at that, you know. And uh, my daughters, uh, you know, mean a lot to me. And my daughter, who was relatively young whenever she had uh, the baby, you know, I was a little uh, anxious about it, as was she, but everything turned out remarkably well. Uh, my daughter works full time as well as going to school full time, so I couldn't ask uh, for a better situation. But uh, uh, about two months ago, we actually got matching tattoos on our wrists. Let me see if I can see them. So anchors. So we're each an anchor in each other's lives. So yeah, I think that that's one of the things that keeps me grounded is my children. Um, and the other thing is, and, and this is not, you know, just giving you hyperbole, um, but in this field, it's good to be around genuine people. Um, whenever things were going swimmingly for me, uh, some of the hardest times that I ever had in this field was being betrayed by people that you thought were your friends. It's a very difficult field to be in. And I'm sure, Dave, you have some horror stories as well. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, you get involved with people and, and you assume that they have the same interest out that you have. Um, they become your friends, they become your confidants, and you think that they're there because they want to be in your lives. And it, it soon, soon, soon shows that, you know, they're jockeying for position. Uh, they want something out of you. Um, and it really does hurt. Um, so if it wasn't for people like you, Dave, and it wasn't people for like Eric Altman, and, uh, you know, a few others, Ken Gearhart, um, I would not be here either. So because you've been steadfast throughout this entire journey as well, uh, is the reason I'm still in this world of the supernatural and the paranormal, because it can chew you up and spit you out in no time. Yeah. I mean, we could do and spend, you know, a week worth of shows just oh. talking about the paradrama that's out there in every field and why anybody with their right sense of mind should really <laughs> not get into this field. Sure. sure. It, you know, yep. but, but I mean, when you look at it and, and you sit there and you think, man, I battled through all of this. I've taken all this harassment. I've uh, been called names that I've never been called before right. in my life. And exactly. I'm not getting paid for any of this. Exactly. You know, it really is a, a paradigm on its own, isn't it? Oh, it is. I mean, you, you really do wonder uh, why people get involved. I mean, there's a lot of people that get involved uh, because they're, you know, they're, they're pretty, they're, 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 they're talking heads for networks and such. Uh, but the people who are really boots on the ground and are, are pouring over articles and archives, and they've been in it for a while because they have all these questions in their lives that need to be answered. Those are the people I tend to gravitate towards. And uh, like I said, you have been there for me and a few others have been there for me. And if it wasn't for that grounding and that anchoring that I had from people like you, there is no way that I would have written more than one or two books. There's no way. Let's get into it because people don't want to hear about the drama 
Mm. And nor do they care. <laughs> Let's just be honest. You know, you know, I, I'm surprised you know? because, yeah, because whenever I talk about this, a lot of people are surprised because they assume that this is a tight knit group because we're kind of on the fringe. So they think that everybody kind of sticks together. And, and, and we're here to say that is not the case. <laughs> oh, no, they will. They will absolutely slice your throat for for a cup of coffee. It's really true. It I mean, I don't know how many times I've I've caught people, you know, stealing information or stealing other others' work and claiming it as their own. You know, I mean, this is a field of made up titles. It's a field of of uh, faux research. You know, uh, where people claim they're they're conducting scientific opinion or scientific study, and yet all they're doing is is sharing their opinions yeah. strongly. Yep. I mean, it, yep. it is it is absolutely ridiculous. Yep. It really is. And, you know, I mean, never mind the money aspect or the business aspect. Somebody is always looking to, to gouge your eyes out and kick you off the pedestal because they just feel that that it's their turn and you have what they want. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't like it. Don't like it. It is vicious. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's something that I've noticed over the last few months, especially where I'm become, I find myself becoming more introverted in this mm -hmm. field. You know, like I was talking to somebody who I trust in this, in this field, one of my sources, and I hadn't heard from him in a month. Mm -hmm. Now this was odd. Like usually when I text this guy, dude, he texts me back within an hour or two, if not minutes and all of a sudden, messages start. Or my, he's not reading them and reading them. And finally, today, he sends me a message, and he says, "No, dude, you didn't piss me off." He goes, "One of the crazies on uh, out there gave my phone number to a bunch of people online, and now my phone is blowing up, mm -hmm. and I don't want to answer my phone, so I'm taking the month off." Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, "Well, that's not good for me." You know, I mean, it's, it's not good for him, but on a personal level where it, when him and I talk, we have anywhere like a short conversation is 45 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and, and it, it just goes to show that you, there are very few you can actually trust in this field guru. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and, and the thing about stealing, I mean, that is one of the biggest thing, uh, the idea of intellectual property. Um, there's a lot of people out there who are writing books and they call themselves documentarians, which basically means they hear a story like you would so eloquently point out earlier. They hear a story and they simply reprint it. You know, they're not doing any research or, or anything like that. So how I made my little niche in this market is I look at um, these kind of things that go bump in the night from an, um, an archetypical point of view. Uh, they're archetypes. They mean something to us. Um, an archetype is a recurring theme that happens over different cultures and over time in particular places. Uh, so I look at the world of the cryptozoological and the world of the supernatural from an archetype point of view. So there's very few people that are going to be able to take that from me because I've kind of established myself in that. And there's really nobody else writing on that. You know, they're, they're writing about encounters and they're writing about this and writing about that. But very few people, if any, that I can name off the top of my head are writing about it from the point of view of looking at it from a psychological and a, um, uh, a sociological point of view as well, too. Uh, the idea of these these things uh, meaning something to us uh, much more than just being monsters. There's something that, uh, you know, um, affects who we are as people and they influence our cultural perspectives as well. I, I totally agree. Let's get into some monsters here. Sure, absolutely. That's, that's the main reason why everybody wants to listen tonight, and they, they want to get right involved with this. Now, the last time we had you on, which was about a, just over a month and a half ago, mm -hmm. you know, we, we talked, and my listeners in our chat rooms were saying, we need a show about werewolves. We never mm -hmm. talk werewolves. Sure, we talk Dogman, Bigfoot, Banshees, mm -hmm. Sea Monsters, whatever, but we always seem to forget werewolves. What's mm -hmm. happening on the werewolf front? Well, it's interesting because my favorite monster ever since I've been a child has been the werewolf. Ever since seeing Lon Chaney's, you know, um, transformation, uh, I couldn't get enough of this creature. Um, so what is happening in the world of werewolves? It's odd because now the idea of the dogman and the werewolf have become so intrinsically linked together, it's hard to tell one apart from the other. But I think in our argument, 
there is really no reason why we should separate them in any way. I think we could take them as face value and kind of look and see what's going on in the world of the dog man, because the dog man is so called because it, it, it resembles a bipedal canid type of creature and it has a degree of intelligence as well too. So I think that when we tie these two together, we see that they're very much alive and well around the world. I mean, not only here in Western Pennsylvania, where people are giving dogman sightings at least once a week, and that's not being exaggerating. I mean, people are still seeing these creatures. But if you look around the world, I mean, there's places in South America and Mexico that are still seeing these creatures on almost a daily basis. Now, whenever we get into those kind of um, cultures. Um, it's very easy to see that there is a repetitiveness to it. So it's almost as if it's a game of telephone where the legend is perpetrating to the point that it's becoming something in and of itself, almost like the development of the chupacabra. Uh, but when you look into more of a Western-based um, uh, uh, development of this creature, um, it has stayed pretty much unchanged for the past several hundred years. So people in Western Pennsylvania are still seeing something that looks like a very large dog. And what I'm talking about, a seven foot tall, uh, two legged animal walking around, uh, peering in their, in their, in their houses at night through their windows, um, sometimes even talking. And that's the other thing that's strange about the, the dog man as well, too. In many cases, there's reports of this creature actually vocalizing. Um, and, and the people that have reported this happening, it seems to be something that's very audible and something that's not happening psychically in any way. It seems as if it is something that's actually being, you know, uh, uh, spoken out that's audible. Um, so when we talk about this and we get into the reports a little bit uh, more here in a second, Dave, um, we can see that this creature still is apparently uh, uh, among us. My goodness. You know, when I think of werewolves, I, I don't think of them being real. I don't see, uh, you know, humans changing on a full moon into this animalistic character that, that you know, grows hair and rips its clothes and, and goes running and howling at the moon. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not an Ozzy Osbourne concert here. Right. That's for sure. How do we know that there is some validity to this creature? Well, so see, that's, that's a great, great point of view. And I think that's the best place to start as well. So what exactly is a werewolf? So the word itself, uh, the W-E-R-E -E at the very beginning comes from a, a very old English word, uh, an archaic word that means man. So that's where we get werewolf or wolf man from. And um, one of the reasons why it was called, um, that had that, 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 uh, the, the adjective in front of it, was that it had an intelligence, like unlike an animal. But... We could also flip it as well, too, and see that a lot of times people were called a wolf because of the attributes in which they exhibited. So if we go back to the time of the Greek writers, um, although the idea of a transforming werewolf was quite valid within Greek thought, um, there were a lot of writers that were saying there was a case of nothing more than mental illness. Um, and that's where we get our word lunacy from, you know, the idea that the moon affects us and uh, it transforms who we are. So the idea of a lunatic, uh, that that has a lot to, of, to do on the, the werewolf legend. But absolutely, when we get up into the Renaissance uh, and even before that in, into the, uh, in, in the uh, Middle Ages, uh, the idea of something transforming into an animal really wasn't implicit within these legends and these lures. It was somebody that was taking on the attributes of an animal and acting in a way that was more bestial than, than human. Um, but that's not to say that there was not the belief, and in some cases, almost the proof of, of a human um, uh, transforming into a creature as well, too. Um, that's the other thing about this. It's very difficult to to just say we're talking about uh, a mentally deranged human being because sometimes these people were torn apart to the point that some investigators assumed that a human being wasn't capable of doing such a thing and, a, and an actual wolf had to be involved. So we're talking about people, if, if this is indeed true uh, mental illness, we're talking about people doing things so heinous that it would be hard for us to wrap our minds around it. No kidding. I like Andrew's comment in the chat room here. It says, Dave, I have trucker stories that I've heard about truckers reporting dogman-type uh, 
creatures running along their rock quarry trucks in the Nevada desert. Like that's just some scary stuff going on there, man. Absolutely. And the thing about that too, is there is a continuity on those reports. So we talk about these things, keeping up with cars, very early reports by Linda Godfrey, you know, the beast of, uh, of Bray road, you know, some of the very earliest reports was this creature running alongside and keeping pace with cars going 55 miles per hour. So that's the, there's a continuity to the, in these sightings. It's not like that's um that's something that's uh, atypical of what's going on. Uh, these creatures are often seen along roads. Uh, they're often seen to interact with uh, with with cars at times, not necessarily uh, getting hit by a car, but sometimes scratching cars or coming up and looking into the beds of, 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 of pickup trucks. Uh, so they will occasionally interact with human beings, uh, but our roads are often the places where these kind of things happen. Uh, one of my theories is that if these creatures are indeed flesh and blood, one of the best places for this creature to uh, to occupy would be around roadways. Because if you think about it, so much roadkill happens around roadways, it's very easy for it to get its meal without having to chase something down. Absolutely. And I understand that. But what's the fascination between these creatures and humans? We have two and a half minutes left. Um, well, I think getting back to the whole idea that that from a very early time, people have been, been doing things, uh, terrible, terrible things against humanity that seems so heinous that it's hard to recognize the humanity within their actions. So they have often dawned the, the 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 aspects of an animal so we do not have to admit that we're capable of doing such things so after our two minutes is up that's something that we can look at even in, in even more um but but there's also uh, a caveat to that as well too that we'll have to get into so it's a very complicated thing to wrap up in two minutes well i understand that but start to tease us a little bit okay so I, I, we will talk about a story called uh the, the uh, werewolf of bedberg and this happened in germany and we will talk about what this guy was capable of doing, and then we'll talk about what his his the people did to him after he was actually after he was caught. How about we do that? Yeah, we can definitely do that. Uh, Black Rabbit here t saying in the chat room, spaced out radio. Dogman are definitely in Canada too. Don't be scared. I know they are in my area. Mm -hmm. I know that. I've met a, a gentleman, a First Nations elder that I really highly respect who told me just a few years ago, him and his uh, brother were out hunting and they were looking for a black bear. Mm -hmm. And what they thought was two black bears 200 yards away in the scope of the gun was two dog men looking at them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the brother looks over to my friend and said, puts his rifle down and says, we got to go. And, and my friend says, aren't we going to take that bear? He goes, that's not a bear, brother. We need to go now. Yep. I mean, that's the reality of it. I don't know what brings it out, mm -hmm. but there are these stories happening all the time. I really don't know how I would react, Guru, to running into one of these dogmen, werewolf type creatures. Well, here in America, one of the earliest reports I've ever got of, of, of an actual dogman attack uh, was in 1889, and it was out of Michigan. And there was a gentleman that was reported to be attacked by a pack of three bipedal wolves. Jeez. Yeah. Wow. So again, there's a continuity to this. You know, we are covering different cultural aspects like first nations to the idea of european immigrants you know and we're still seeing continuity guru i'm gonna get you to hold on right there the crypto guru ronald murphy on spaced out radio monster talk werewolves dogman here we go people we're in for a good one tonight the stories start right after this All right, we're clear, buddy. All right, excellent, excellent. Good, solid first half hour. Yeah, it was it, it flew by, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I want to get some notes here. I want to look through my notes. Every time I come on to the show, I always bring a lot of notes. So. Oh. 
It's going to be a good one. Yep. Yep. I hear you, man. I hear you. We're going in for a power show tonight. Yes, we are. Yeah, this is this is guru power at its best right here, audience. <laughs> we have a lot of people on the night, don't we? Uh, so far on YouTube, we have 131. That's yeah, that's pretty good, man. Yeah, that number will go up yet. It's still early yet. Smoky Mountain Wanderer, how you doing? Good to see you. Angela Wilbert, welcome to Spaced Out Radio's chat room. She's from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Nice. <coughs> Cat Ward says, Ronnie, mwah. <laughs> I love Cat Ward. I'm glad that she's on. Yeah, she's good people. Good Canadian kid. Uh, I'm trying to find the chat room here. Where do I go to find the chat? I'll make it easier for you. Go on our screen that you're looking at me on. Yeah. Go to the top uh, right. There's a little box that says comments. Yeah. Click on that. You'll be able to see it all. Let me see here. Oh, <laughs> that's a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't I don't know if you could type in from a guest side on that. Okay. Uh, like right below all the chat. Uh, I don't know if it says post a comment. <laughs> uh, there's the gorgeous and talented Jessica McCreary. Give us a wave, Jessica. She's always fashionably late, even when she's not. With any smartphone or tablet. Mm-hmm. Stone Hobbit, how are you? Oh, that's got to be one of the greatest nicknames. There she is. Throwing us some kisses. She's been with us for a year. The lovely and talented Shiny Ray is here. You know what this lady forced me to do? Shiny Ray? What's that? Remember when I had my big beard? I do. Well, Shiny Ray is hearing impaired. Okay. She couldn't read my lips through my beard. <laughs> so because, and I, and I thought, you know what? I've never had anybody say that before. And obviously if she's struggling, there are other people who are struggling. And one of the people that I work with on my daytime job is hearing impaired as well. So I shaved my beard for her. You know what? You're a hell of a guy, Dave. Yeah, I'm that guy. I'm totally that guy. You are that guy. Ross Smith, how are you? So that way I keep my beard nice and clean now so she could actually read my lips if she needs some help. Wow. Yeah. Drew Morris, what's happening in Springfield, Pennsylvania? I just want to go to a Springfield in the United States. Just once. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a lot, like, in the Midwest, like, you know, Ohio and uh, uh, the state of Indiana and uh, uh, Illinois. There's Springfields all over the place. Just to say I've been to a Springfield. Sure, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Clean these up. Put those there. Clean that up. Put that there. All right, Guru, we got 30 seconds. Thank you so much to Andrew, to Murray, to Michael for the amazing super chats. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. Hi, gorgeous Lynn Sows. How are you? Nice to see you back. And uh, thank you to all of our new subscribers. Kian, how are you? Or Kian? I'm sorry. I always butcher your name, my friend, but I always appreciate when you're here. I'm from Canada. Here we go. Hey, 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 hey. 
Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Really do appreciate earning your listening ears. want to remind you that if you have missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button, our website, spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with the crypto guru, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. You can find any of his books on Amazon. Highly suggest you do. In my opinion, he is one of the best writers of everything crypto natural, if we can use that term. I just made that up. Crypto like natural. I like that. It works for me. Guru, welcome back. Hey, thanks a lot, Dave. I'm glad to be here, man. I'm talking about my favorite subject. Yes, werewolves tonight, all night long. Let, let's get into it. I know uh, you. I know uh, that right before the break, you wanted to get into where I asked, uh, you know, people's fascination sure. with, with werewolves. Right. So, in the idea of a transformation uh, as opposed to non-transformation. Uh, so whenever I get an, uh, asked this question, which is all the time, uh, I always look at the one particular case uh, from a, right around 1589 in Germany. Uh, and this guy's name was Peter Stumpf. Um, and he was called the Beast of Bedburg or Bedburg uh, Werewolf, a lot of different names. Uh, but anyways, he was about 55 years old. And he was on a killing spree for basically 25 years of his life. Um, he would um, claim, uh, quite literally, uh, that he would transform into an animal. Um, he was practicing the arts of black magic. Um, he was said to have summoned the devil. Uh, the devil gave him a belt, a, a wolfskin belt to wear. And whenever Peter would put it around his waist, he would transform into a wolf. Okay, so that being said, we'll talk about some of the heinous things that he did. Um, he started off by killing livestock, you know, lambs and goats. Uh, then he would move up to bigger animals like cows and horses. Um, and then he started to feed upon his own children. Um, he killed his own son. He, you know, he claimed to uh, have eaten the child's brain. Uh, and then he moved on to men and women. One of the favorite things, uh, one of his favorite targets was pregnant women um, who he would kill and then um, take the fetus out of them and uh, and eat the fetuses. That's So he was basically looking for that. So a terribly, terribly heinous man who um, probably killed around 14 people in his life, if not more. Uh, claimed he did indeed transform into a wolf. Uh, he was captured by the authorities, um, and then he was subsequently tortured. Um, now, this is where the idea of somebody doing so something so heinous that we can see that it's hard for us to accept that a human being is capable of doing such things. But let's talk a little bit about his his um, his uh, the people that were uh, going through his inquisition. Um, these people uh, took him uh, and they, uh, they they put him on the rack and they proceeded to break every bone in his body. Um, after breaking literally every bone in this man's body, uh, they went about uh, the, uh, the the disemboweling of him and uh, removing all of his entrails uh, while he was still alive. And whenever he was finally he finally succumbed to his torture, uh, he was then set on fire. Now, as his body uh, was consumed by the flames, uh, they bring his little daughter to the site to watch her dad being consumed by the flames. And then thinking that somehow this curse may have been passed on from the father to this young daughter, they then threw her into the fire. So we are talking about something that we would call today a serial killer, okay? He was doing very, very horrible things that we could not find imaginable. But also we have to understand the time in which they were, were being committed as well. This was a time whenever the law could do anything with the person that was accused of something. So this was a very, very violent time. So we can think that these werewolves are also a product of the time in which they live. So 
part of my job as somebody that follows archetypes is to look at them within the 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 milieu of the of the culture in which they uh, survive. Uh, so when we talk about the the werewolf of the medieval period and of the Renaissance period, these are something that are hiding off on the periphery. They're right beyond the comprehension of of the of the normal world, the civilized world. Also, because these were terribly religious times, the transformation had to involve the act of the devil. There had to be good and evil. There had to be this structuralism going on as well, too. So a person could not transform on their own. It had to be something that was given to him as a gift by Satan himself. Now, it's interesting because when we look at werewolves now in the 21st century, and believe me, they're out there, they're often seen in shows that are geared to teenagers, uh, shows like The Descendants, or um, uh, I, I, there's a lot of different vampire shows out there. Uh, my daughter is insanely attached to these shows, but they involve witches and vampires and werewolves, the same way the Twilight series involved werewolves as well, too. Um, now they're kind of sexy. Um, they don't stick out on the periphery anymore. They're right involved with us. You know, they go to high school with normal kids. Uh, it's not so much as a curse anymore. It's more of a gift. They are able to assume this kind of demeanor and have these kind of attributes that the normal clumsy high school kid wish that they would have, you know, this surety, this bravado to them. So it's very interesting to see how these creatures evolve in subsequent generations and to see where they're headed to. So if we would go back 500 years, um, the werewolf would have been something that would be a demonic creature. It would have been something to fear at night because at night that's whenever the devil comes out to play. Um, but nowadays we see uh, in our uh, in our world around us reports of seeing these creatures in the daylight. They're no longer um, uh, you know thrown into the shadows anymore. They're more out in the open. So, um, you know, as, as a researcher and a writer, I think that's very, very interesting. We have the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, here tonight on Spaced Out Radio. So how did this story come over to North America, that there are werewolves running around here? Okay. Well, the idea of the werewolf obviously came over with the immigrants. Um, but that's really not... <laughs> It's a lot more complicated than that. So we brought over the word werewolf, but believe you me, before there was any kind of Colombian contact, uh, we are talking about the Pacific Northwest that have legends of the werewolf going back thousands of years. Uh, their totem poles have the wolf emblazoned on them in the Pacific Northwest. Um, the uh, Mississippian culture, uh, in Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, Kentucky, and Tennessee, had the cult of the wolf. Now, this is extremely interesting. Um, and whenever I give a talk on uh, on on this creature, this is one of the things that I pull in. So we're talking about a culture that existed. You know, we're going back. You know, probably three thousand years, two thousand years. To, you know, at the most, cons uh, you know, to be very conservative. But we're talking about we're going back into antiquity at this point. Um, the cult of the werewolf existed um, because we have found within their burial mounds uh, humans that were literally deformed um, after death in order to look like a wolf. And let me tell you what happens. So the cultures would exhume the body and go as far as removing the jaws and the teeth of the person that it was deceased and implant a wolf skull inside the face itself. So it would look like the person was decomposing was not only part man, but also part wolf. Um, to make the, the transformation whole, they would also wrap the body in some sort of fur. So it would look like there was this complete melding of the two different, uh, two different creatures into one. So when we talk about the cult of the werewolf, uh, that is something that goes back into the earliest times of the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the prehistoric Indian nations of uh, the East Coast here in the United States. 
what is so interesting about this as well is these cultures are in the same area where we have the reports of dogmen. So there's this overlapping. There again, we talk about continuity. Um, one of the things that makes the the dogman um, so interesting, looking at it over a uh, cross cultural perspective, is they're often associated with the world of the dead, of burial mounds. Um, if we think about Anubis, that goes back maybe six thousand years. Anubis, the god, uh, the jackal headed god of the Egyptians was shortly there before the, the the earliest kingdom was established. So they had a tradition going back of a person that was able to assume the shape of a wolf. And isn't it interesting that they presided over the world of the dead? Now we come to the new world, we come to the United States, we come to the First Nations people in Canada, and some of these sites that we, well, these, these burial mounds, this is where these dogman creatures are often sighted. Um, Linda Godfrey pointed it out as well, too, that they're often seen around the, the burial sites around the uh, the, um, the Great Lakes region. Um, I spoke to a gentleman that told me that he saw a dog man outside of um, a burial mound in upstate New York. Uh, so uh, these creatures that were reported, uh, like I said, in, in, in the Mississippian culture, you know, 2000 years ago, we are still getting reports to this day where that culture used to exist. Um, one of the cases is a place called Land Between the Lakes. I'm not sure if you ever covered this on the show before, um, but this is a, uh, a reclamation project where they flooded an area between Kentucky and Tennessee uh, and put in a, a vast lake that was now being used for, uh, for um, recreational purposes. But there's a story that goes that there was a creature a dogman-like creature, a werewolf creature, for lack of a better word, that would roam this area. And it was not a good idea to put in a lake there to make this recreational, but they did it nonetheless. And people that venture into that area are in danger. And one report was that there was a person that was archery hunting, and they found his body still in the tree stand, um, completely uh, obliterated. Something came in, climbed the tree, and completely destroyed the person that was up there. Um, and then uh, very close to this time, uh, there was a family that was camping in an RV and uh, they found the family torn to shreds and they found one of their children's arms draped from a tree a few hundred yards away from the site. And this all takes place in that area where these Native Americans 2000 years ago were making their deceased into this combination of wolf and man. Guru, normally I don't ask questions until hour number two, but I like this one by Michael, who is saying, what's the difference between werewolves and skinwalkers? Okay. okay. Um, to me, this this is my explanation. Skinwalkers seem to be more spiritual. Uh, they seem to, to derive from something other than humanity. Um, they seem to be magical uh, almost shamanistic creations, as if they were summoned or is they somehow transcended into our world, if that makes any sense. Uh, they seem to be um, capable of taking on different shapes, not only wolf shapes, but also uh, the shapes of human beings as well, too. So to me, at least, they more reside in the world of the jinn than in the world of what we would call the werewolf. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I And let's also note, too, that, that skinwalkers are supposed to be shaman that have gone rogue. Right. So shaman that have gone rogue. Um, you know, they they're, there's still a human quality to them. Uh, oftentimes people are reporting hearing whistles or their name being called or, or, you know, these kind of very human aspects coming from these creatures in order to um, get the people off the trail, you know, to, to lead them into something far more dangerous. But absolutely, it seems to me as if there is this, this, and indeed, it could very well, Dave, be originating from a time whenever the shaman had entered into this kind of state and assumed something that they could no longer break its hold of. You know, to, to think about a shaman, it is the ability to go from this world into another world and to be a conduit. So 
it's it's taking yourself, emptying yourself out, and allowing yourself to be a vessel for something else. Now we talk about possessions and everything like that. So you could imagine somebody that was emptying themselves out, and something like the gin would enter them, or something that would take on the name of a skinwalker would enter them, and what kind of chaos could ensue thereafter. Ronald Murphy, the crypto guru, is here tonight on Spaced Out Radio. So what's the difference then between a dog man and a werewolf? Okay, and another excellent question. Uh, this is, again, this is just my take. Um, when we talk about werewolf, we automatically assume there's some sort of transformation that takes place. A dog man, it seems as if this cryptid is indeed that form all the time if that makes any sense. That there's, yeah. no, there's no, no necessary transformation that needs to take place. All right. So one said to be part human. The other one said to be full animal. Full animal, but, but, but that does not act solely on instinct. It, it, it may be, you know, it, this may be one of the new, it's just a new cryptid on the block, but it may be one of the oldest cryptids as well, too, because there have been reports of this kind of creature for thousands of years. Like I said, we can talk about the Egyptian take on this, you know, in the next uh, after break as well, too. Um, these creatures have been around with us for quite some time. We call them dog men now because they, 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 they kind of have this new status, but it's not like they just appeared out of nowhere. They've always been around. Uh, we're just noticing them more. And I think that we're starting to separate them from other kind of bipedal creatures that walk around in the woods at night as well, too. Um, we have to understand we could go back only 100 years ago. Actually, no, we can go back only a little over 50 years ago before the word Bigfoot was in our vernacular. Uh, before that, we had Wild Man, we had Goblin, we had all these other kind of names to call it, but we never called it Bigfoot. Um, so think about this as well, too. How many times Bigfoot might have been sighted or a dog man might have been sighted? Uh, again, so we, we never really separated the two until very, very recently. So I think a lot of people that have said that they've seen Bigfoot may indeed have seen dog man as well, too. Before, how much longer do we have to go in, on break? We have about five and a half minutes. All right, let me tell you this story here real quick because this will kind of tie things in together. Um, one of the first expeditions I ever went on uh, was with uh, with uh, Eric Altman, who will be your guest next month, and a, a gentleman by the name of Sam Sherry. Uh, he was an older gentleman who claimed that he had seen a Bigfoot, and he spent the rest of his life, literally the rest of his life, trying to capture one or sh uh, showing proof that um, that these things were out there so people wouldn't think that he was nuts. So we were walking in the woods one time uh, up on the Chestnut Ridge. And um, the first time I ever got a chance to meet the gentleman, he was very, he was an older, he was older, but he was very spry. And he had this kind of devilish uh, sparkle in his eye. And it, it, he was one of those kind of people that whenever the words left his mouth, you knew immediately that he was genuine. He was not telling, you know, he wasn't lying to you, but he was telling me about his Bigfoot encounters. You know, he said that he had seen two types of Bigfoot. Um, one was the big kind of lumbering forest giant that everybody thinks about. Very benign, kind of like a guardian of the woods, if you were. And then he came to a stop and he looked at me and he said, but there's another type of Bigfoot out here as well, too. He said, it's much thinner than the other Bigfoot. And it's, it, its face comes out almost into a muzzle and it hunts in packs. Now, this was, I believe, 1999, whenever he told me this story. I had never heard about Dogman before, but immediately whenever he told me this, the, the image that came into mind was uh, a werewolf. You know, he was describing something that he had seen out there that he called another species, another type of Bigfoot, when in reality, I think that he was seeing two very different creatures. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Now, werewolves are very aggressive towards people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why are they aggressive towards humans? Like in the horror movies, we always see them chasing down the young teenage couple or the woman in distress. Why go after people? Um, 
we're very easy, my friend. Um, we are uh, so from the very beginning, and I'm talking about from the very beginning, the name that we get for werewolves, which is lycanthrope, comes from uh, this this Greek king named Lycon. Okay, so that's where we get the name from. Um, his first commission of of murder was against a child. Whenever we talk about this constant connection in all these werewolf tales, it almost always involves predation of children. Um, and it's one of those sad, very, very sad things about, about the werewolf mythos. Um, but alongside that, when we talk about regular human beings, uh, we do not have claws. Uh, we don't run very fast. We don't have the wherewithal to really um, defend ourselves against uh, these kind of creatures. Um, and we're, after, we, after we come back, I, I, we, we have to talk at length about the, the Beast of Gévaudan, which is really one of the most documented cases. Um, but I think that that case will show how easy it is to prey upon human beings. And I think that one of the reasons why it is, it's not simply a damsel in distress because werewolves the werewolf tells the dogman tells they there's no problem with them uh killing livestock that happens all the time um but whenever food becomes a, a little bit of a scarcity uh people will very very readily fill the um fill the menu okay so with this creature is it much like a vampire where you have to invite it into your home in order for it to cross that line no, you know, nothing like that. No, no, no. These things will come look look for you. Um, and, you know, there has been um, this very strange case uh, in the middle of Maine uh, where people said uh, that they, their, their new house that they had bought uh, was under siege of werewolves, uh, that in the middle of the night these things would come, it would tap on the windows, it would try both doors at the same time, the back door and the front door. And it would even go as far as calling out one of the members in the household's name, trying to get them out. So it's not like they're as tactful and as gentlemanly as a, as a, a Dracula or a vampire. Uh, these things are definitely working on a mind of their own and they would be the ultimate predators. If we are to believe all these stories. That is just incredible. I mean, could you imagine what that would be like hearing this? Well, okay, that goes back to the idea of the skinwalker as well, too. Uh, the idea of the skinwalker is a lot of times you know they're around and you don't even see them is because you hear disembodied voices, you hear a woman crying, you hear a woman screaming, you hear your name being called, you hear disembodied laughter. Uh, so whenever we talk about the idea of the werewolf or the wolfman, that's where the humanity comes inside into it, isn't it? It's that kind of um, uh, attempt at copying who we are, but it's never quite possible to completely duplicate it. There's always something unnatural about it, but they still try to get in uh, any way they can by latching on to that human side of who we are. That's just crazy. Absolutely crazy. I don't know what it would be like to experience that. We'll talk more werewolf, dogman, the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy is here and we're having a good time with the guru tonight. Do you love werewolves and dogman and other creatures of the night? Like Vinny finally showed up in our chat room. We'll have more in Hour 2 of Space Out Radio. All right, we're clear. Excellent. I'll let you chat with the audience. I'm just going right. to run my dogs outside, okay? That's the word. I will do that. I will do that. So whenever I chat with the audience, I like to go onto the comment section and yeah. see what people are saying here. Yeah, um, you go ahead. Okay. And I like it whenever people talk about me too. So somebody said this 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 guest is great. I love that. Okay, Betty Spaghetti, I think that we covered out this before. 
Um, the idea of breakfast for dinner is completely something that we can never discuss again. Uh, the two are diametrically opposed to each other. Um, <laughs> um, great guest, Night Gazer. See, anytime you do this to me, I actually love this. Um, Western Pennsylvania, Flyers or Pens, you got to go with the Penguins, buddy. Solar Warden. Um, although I'm not, a, I'm not a huge hockey fan, um, but I think that if I would go to more games, uh, yeah. So angels are life. Where does the word lichen come from? Uh, lichen comes from King Lyacon. Uh, he was in Arcadia. We'll have to remember, remind Dave to come back because this is such an interesting story. Um, but yeah, it's derived from, um, uh, it's an eponymous word that derives from a human being. Um, yeah, I will get to a werewolf, uh, werewolf encounters where the werewolf speaks. Absolutely. Um, somebody also texted me and asked me if I was drinking beer. Uh, I am drinking root beer, unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it. I need some sugar to keep me going. Uh, so no real beer here tonight. Um, and uh, so Paranormal Heart Podcast, Ron, you need to sell those hats you're wearing and I would autograph them. I could look into that. I think that that would be good. Do you think any strange experience? Okay, Apollo 11, we could talk about that as well, too. Um, uh, I did not buy Bitcoin, coin, although I think 416 Bitcoin probably is a robot. Is that true? I don't know. But I would like to get into cryptocurrency. Um, Eve, I'm stranded here. Just pretend it's a tropical island. Sounds very, very interesting. And I have a good imagination. Uh, let's see here. Pump Plum Island is very interesting as well, too. I truly appreciate the way. Uh, that's, you know what? Uh, Overlander Canada. I, I really appreciate that so much. And we could come on and do a Jersey Devil uh, uh, talk at one time as well, too. Um, I'm trying to get right now, I'm in the process of uh, uh, getting a partner uh, to go on expeditions with me. And because Pennsylvania is so close uh, to the uh, Pine Barrens, I would love to make that work and do a live feed uh, from the Pine Barrens. So that's something that may happen relatively soon if all this stuff will work out for me. And things sometimes work out for me. We'll see what happens. Um, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, that's, that's what I, um, let's see. My cheek face bleeding so my eyes can't fully see the okay great, uh, contour cause me. Let's see. Let's see what else. You sound educated. Do you have any degrees? Uh, Vinnie Barbarino. Uh, I, I actually have a degree in literature. Uh, I have a master's in uh, history. Um, I also have a master's in educational administration, and I have a master's in um, – and uh, family development as well too. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, and, and that's a good thing too, because whenever I was studying literature and whenever I was studying history, uh, there would be all these great allusions to things like wild men and werewolves and vampires. Uh, you really don't even have to read between the lines. There's a lot of material out there. Uh, so really, I, I, I grew closer, even though I loved this stuff as kids. I actually grew closer uh, to uh, these things the older that I got uh, because they were so fleshed out in uh, the, the uh, literature and the history that I was reading. And, uh, of course, Kat wants to discuss the Loop Guru, uh, which is that uh, that uh, French-Canadian werewolf up there in Canada that was brought down to New Orleans uh, by, uh, by uh, the, uh, oh, the Cajun folks, right? Is that what I'm thinking of? Yeah. Um, let's see here. Has avoiding confirmed? Let's see, Dave and SR. Yes, yes. Are are there werewolves in Wheeling? Wheeling, West Virginia. Tom, my buddy Tom is in the house as well, too. Um, I think there probably are werewolves in uh, West Virginia. <laughs> I love it. Um, no, you know what, though? Have you heard Psalm 22 21 as a word against? Uh, dogmen. I, I, I have not heard that, although I do know Psalm 22 very much because I have a, of a, a minor in, um, in religion, religious studies. But what's so cool about Psalm 22 
um, is that it talks about these animals that will come against you. Uh, sometimes, I know what you're referring to, uh, sometimes that is uh, translated as, it can be translated as bulls, I've seen it translated as lions, and I've also trans seen it translated as, um, as wolves as well too. But very, very interesting. Uh, but if you need to pray to a saint against werewolf attacks, Saint Hobart is the person that you pray to. All right, Ron, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to come back here in about 25 seconds. A big thank you to Ed, Michael Times 2, Betty Spaghetti, Fabster, Snakes, Andrew, and Murray for the amazing Super Chats tonight. Really do appreciate it. We'll get to more of your questions as we come on. Thank you to all the veterans who are listening to this show. Hey, X Caliperful, good to have you back, buddy. Thank you for coming on in. And here we go, everyone. Let's uh, hang on out for hour two. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. And thank you to everyone tuning on in or on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on Talk Stream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Elitriferous. Elitriferous is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as a clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Mumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. The Crypto Guru is back talking werewolves and dogman all night long as the guru is one of the best authors when it comes to everything cryptid, folklorish, and legendary. His website, thecryptoguru.org, I believe. Dot, I think it's dot net. Dot dot net. net. Yes. All right. Ronald L. Murphy Jr. on Amazon if you want to check out his books. So let's check it on out. Guru, welcome back. Thanks a lot, Dave. I, I, I can't believe how quickly our time flies here. But if it wasn't for these great, uh, this great audience that you had, this could really drag. There's so many excellent questions on these things. Oh, yeah. Everybody loves a good werewolf story. My well, they're intelligent, they're intelligent people as well, too. Don't get me wrong. Look, I'm glad that they're here for me. Uh, but, you know, they come in. Uh, I don't care if you're talking about ghosts or, or, or UFOs. They're always here with these kind of questions. So. The best yeah. in the business. We're pretty, pretty blessed around here, my friend. Pretty, pretty blessed. I could tell you that. Guru, I want to get into the werewolf situation with you because do you really believe that there are humans who have werewolf-like qualities that when the full moon comes out, the only thing that's going to stop them from transforming is a silver bullet? Well, I will tell you my story uh, that I had. Okay, so... Growing up in Western Pennsylvania and being in Western Pennsylvania, there's not a lot of stuff here. I'm about 35 miles outside of Pittsburgh. So I am in a very rural area where we'll get deer in the yard and turkeys and stuff like that. So there's really not much to do here. So people tend to gravitate to have these kind of, uh, these kind of uh, notions, these kind of interests to like little shops, like little new age shops and such. So it just so happened that one of my friends had a new age shop called Magical Manor in a town where I grew up in Blairsville. And uh, she would get a great selection of people who were practicing pagans, who were, um, you know, uh, into spirituality. Uh, and there would also be people in there that would get a lot of uh, uh, sightings of strange creatures. So there was one lady that kept on coming into the shop and she was telling us that um, she had found herself a boyfriend. She was a single mother. She had been looking for or for some time. And she finally met the guy of her dreams as a cat jumps up on me. Uh, she finally meets the guy of her dreams. 
and um, and he's coming to live with her. You know, they they met online. Uh, this is truly destiny. They found each other. Uh, so in, in about a week, uh, she starts bringing him into the shop as well. Too, he was very quiet. He kind of stayed to himself over in the corner. Um, he was. It's really hard to describe how he was. Introverted is not the word. More like very painfully, um, very painful in in in, in social situations. Um, almost bordering on an autistic, uh, autistic spectrum, I would say. But um, so she would bring him in and he wouldn't talk. But after a while, he started to come into the shop by himself, uh, not saying anything, just looking around, sometimes making, you know, little comments about some crystals or such. But one time he came in and he said, I have something to get off of my chest. He said, I, I am a werewolf. Now, we immediately thought that this guy was, you know, insane, right? I mean, there's nothing else to, to think. But after this admission, he went into some details. Um, he said that his father uh, was a werewolf. And whenever the transformation occurred, and it wasn't something that occurred with the, the cycles of the moon. It was obviously something biochemical to him but you could feel it actually coming upon you they would take the dad downstairs the mother would take the dad downstairs they would chain him to the, in the basement they would lock the basement door and then he and his and his brothers and sisters and the mom would physically leave their home for about a week and then come back after the transformation process was completed but the reason why he brought this out to us was that he felt that if he transformed, he would do something to the child, you know, the, his girlfriend's child. And again, like I talked about earlier, in these werewolf accounts throughout history, children were often the focus of the predations of a werewolf. So he was, he was afraid that he was going to hurt the child and he needed to get as far away from the, 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 his girlfriend and her child that he could. So, a few days later, the girlfriend comes in and said that my boyfriend, I, I have no idea where he is. I, I have no idea. He left. Nobody said anything to her because we really didn't know what this gentleman was capable or not capable of doing. And we didn't really understand if his story was plausible or not, because this is, of course, somebody just just telling us the way that he was feeling. Um so about a week later happen, goes by and then he comes into the shop by himself and he said, I did indeed uh, transform, but I got as far out of town as I possibly could. And he went to this place uh, very near to where I live now called Livermore. Um, it's a very isolated area. The Army Corps of Engineers came in and took it over. It's all flood territory right now. There's only one way in and one way out and that's the same way. But if you were going to transform and you wanted to stay hidden, that would be the place to do it in a relatively well um, urbanized area, you know, or, you know, away from towns and everything. So he claimed he went down there and he transformed in this wilderness area. But while he was down there, he ran into a female werewolf and they ran that area together because apparently this female werewolf went down there so she wouldn't prey upon human beings either. So these stories that I was hearing was fascinating. Uh, it was, you know, a uh, psychological insight, at least into this way this gentleman's mind was working. Um, you know, he said he didn't want to hurt the child. So you would think that he had some sort of proclivity to maybe hurt children or whatever. But whenever he came back into the shop after he claimed that he transformed, he did exhibit some physical changes. Um, his, uh, his, his cheekbones seemed higher. Um, it seemed as, his, if, as, as if his face was somehow misshapen or transformed in some way. Um, as the story goes, uh, he ended up leaving again. Uh, and this time he went back to California and was never heard from again. Uh, so, you know, all of your listeners out there, maybe the best place to meet somebody is not on Tinder. 
uh, because you don't know what you might be getting. But what's so fascinating about this area, Livermore, it's prone to Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, hauntings, and now apparently there's, there's werewolves down there. So shortly after this case, I decided to do a nighttime investigation down there. Um, and it was right around midnight. Um, and all of a sudden, and this is where the idea of the paranormal world kind of, there's really no gray area. Things start um, kind of blending into each other. But when we were in the area where he claims that he had transformed, my partner and I, that I was down there with one of my investigative partners, um, we started to see what appeared to be um, static electricity forming in the air around us. It looks almost as if you pulled a cover off of your bed and that little bit of static electricity, except it was in the air around us. It was as if the air was becoming electrified. We had no idea what was going on, but we knew instinctually it was time to get the hell out of there. So we start heading back to where we parked our cars, and it's about a mile back there. This is no place to play around. This is pretty dense area. Um, and like I said, it's not a very well-marked area at all. There's one trail that goes through there. But as we start making our way back to where our vehicles are, we notice a light that just kind of emanates in front of us. About 100 yards off, um, we went back and measured it. It was about eight foot off the ground. Um, it looked as if somebody lit a flare. The flare ignited. It held its 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 blaze for maybe one second, and then it just kind of went off again. But after that blaze ignited, something then was immediately in the woods. Now, we talk about portals, we talk about all these kind of things opening up and everything. I'm not sure what happened, but all that I know that after that emanation of this electrical light came on, something then starts pacing beside us in the woods off to our right. Um, we never saw it, um, but we knew uh, in our minds what the thing looked like. We know that it had this orangish, yellowish eyes, we knew that it was on four legs, but we knew that it was capable of going bipedal if it wanted to. And um, uh, the gentleman and I who was with me, we both knew that it had some sort of snout and we could see within our mind's eye these teeth, okay? Again, psychologically imprinted in our, our minds from this creature or if it was some sort of wishful thinking on our part, I have no idea. All we know is that there was something following us in the woods to the point that we were becoming very, very frightened. Um, and we looked down and we were no longer on the path anymore. We had veered off the path and now we were up literally waist deep in bushes and jaggers and everything like that. And what had happened at this next juncture is really what kind of gives me the shivers up the spine. So whatever was following us on the right-hand side was keeping pace with us, but off to the left and about a few hundred yards away from where we were was is a very old cemetery. From that cemetery, I heard my name being called just one time. It was just Ron. But it was loud enough and audible enough to know that, that we knew that we would have, if we followed that voice, we would get back on the trail, which we did. So if we did not hear that voice, we were going to get further and further into this thicket. And that is where this thing, I believe, wanted us to go. So without something calling my name, we would not have found the trail to get back to the car. So after my name was called, we, we found the trail quite quickly. And whatever that was that was following us never left the underbrush, but it did escort us the entire way back. Uh, to where we're parked before it left. So that is one of those situations where we were looking for a supposed werewolf and a lot of very weird things was going on as well, too. Um, I don't know if that was a human being that transformed into a werewolf. I don't know if it was a, a dog man. What, what, what was that light? I have no idea. But that is a story that has been really keeping me going um, for all these years, 
because I truly want to get to the bottom of that. And I, I think that if you would talk to other investigators in Western Pennsylvania, especially whenever you have Eric Oldman on next month, how many people will say that they experience these strange lights in the woods? Um, again, I don't know how it all comes into play, but that is my story regarding uh, the werewolf and uh, regarding hearing um, my name being called as well. Maybe you'll understand when I when I say this, and maybe many of our experienced listeners will as well. When you have an experience of something, you know that energy that it creates, and your body remembers that energy pattern. So if you're around a ghost, you usually feel heavy on your shoulders. If if you have extraterrestrial activity, people will say that you feel high as a kite, like, like you're spinning around, like want to go, like where is it, where is it, where is it? And people who have Bigfoot uh, energy coming around them, they have a, a sense of calmness but fear at the same time. People who are around dogmen tend to have an absolute shuddering of fear. The energy feels very heavy, like something is telling you, get the heck out of here now type of energy. Do you know what I'm saying about that, Guru? Yeah, I absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It, it, you know, I, it, it, now, getting back to the idea of the, um, of the archetype, uh, one of the reasons why we have these instincts of flight or fight is because we had to have had, and this is a little, this is a little scary to think about, you know, we've been in our present forms on this planet for about 200,000 years. You know, that's how, you know, we're setting any religion aside and everything. If you would look at the evolutionary um, uh, opinions that are out there, that we have been in our present form for about 200,000 years on this planet. It is my suggestion that the things that we call werewolves and the things that we call Bigfoot and all these other kind of monsters have been with us throughout this evolutionary process um, to the point that our interactions with these creatures were on a regular basis. Now, as we have ascended to primacy on this planet and we've pushed these creatures now into areas where few people travel, but we still remember them in our DNA. They're embroidered into our DNA. So even if we don't see them, we understand them, if that makes any sense to you, Dave. That we are, that, 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 that is part of our collective unconscious and that we have this as a cultural folk, folk memory and no matter where we are and no matter what our station is life, that these creatures, because they had been with us for all these thousands of years, they still impact us to today. They are stuff of nightmares. And the reason there are stuff of nightmares is because they can become archetypes to us, uh, uh, to us human beings. Very true. Very true. That leads to Michael's question. What's the difference then between a hellhound and a dog man? A, a hellhound. Excellent question. Okay. So what happens in the middle ages? We start having these ideas of churches being either under attack or being guarded by dogs. So the hellhound is literally that. Uh, it probably derives from Cerebus, you know, the idea of the hound of hell uh, in Greek mythology. Um, so what happens is uh, churches um, in the Middle Ages uh, start um, feeling as if they're coming under attack. And not only feeling it, but in one particular time, uh, and I don't have, I, I don't remember the, uh, the date off the top of my head, but I think it was in the, uh, the mid-1500s, um, there was a terrible storm. Again, getting back to the idea of electricity, there was a terrible storm, and uh, one church, uh, uh, these two churches were about seven miles apart from each other, but at the exact same time, this is what happened. As the storm starts rising, a wolf, a dog, a hellhound, enters this one church, goes down the owl, looking, specifically looking for its target. It finds a man and it finds its young son. It goes up there. It rips the throats out of both of these people. A couple people try to lay their hands on the wolf to get the wolf out. They die just by touching this creature. And as it leaves the, the church, it scratches down the door 
And that scratch mark is still there to this very day. No if way. you want to go over there and take a look at it. Now, seven miles from this place, at the exact same time, another black hound enters the church and, again, kills several people. Everybody that witnessed that creature killing those people at that church were all dead within a year's time. Um, so this is a very interesting thing where we come up with the idea of the hellhound. Now, there's also something at this time called the church grim. And this probably goes back to uh, the pagan origins or the pagan influences on Christianity um, because it was believed that if you were going to build a church um, that you would want it guarded by a dog. So sometimes, especially in the, the, the Greco-Roman world, you would literally take a dog and you would sacrifice it and you would bury it under your temple grounds and it would act as a spiritual protector of that place. By the time you get to Catholicism, that probably wasn't going on, although I would not put it past anybody to take a dog and to kill it and put it in there as a protection. I'm sure that it did happen. But a church grim was a dog that was used to protect their protect the, the guard the grounds of the church and the cemetery from the, of the church from the devil himself. So these are these these black church grims. Now, what is so cool about the church grim is we know that there is some evidence to support that these things were tied into the werewolf dogman legend. Um, in Sussex, uh, in England, um, and it's been about 10 years ago, uh, there was the unearthing on church grounds of a dog that stood on its hind legs, would have been over seven feet tall and well over 200 pounds. I never was able to find the, uh, the DNA results concerning uh, this particular creature. But we do know, that, at least in this instance, that the idea that these there were actual huge dogs used to protect churches uh, was something that was regularly used. And again, you know, are these supernatural dogs? Are these people that were capable of transforming into something? We don't know. But if you look at the legends and you look at the folklore, these creatures were out of the ordinary, let us say. No kidding. Guru, you know, I know we have about one minute here before we got to go to break, but the fact that this goes back in a lot of lengthy history, let's bring it to this timeline. Are there any quality stories out there of recent, say the last 50 years of people being attacked by werewolves? No, we will. We, absolutely. Do you want to do it now? Or do you want to do it whenever we come back? It was a short 45 second one. All right, so uh, it was just about 10 years ago in California, um, uh, a, a man who believed that he was a werewolf and he believed that he was married to a she-wolf um, actually went next door and shot their neighbor uh, because they believed that he was a vampire and he was uh, uh, invading in on their territory. So that's one of the stories that we have. But the idea of Richard Ramirez, even, when we look at that, the, the famous Night Stalker, um, he believed in the th that he would be able to transform into a creature and actually would drink and lap up human blood. So the idea that there not only being vampire cults out there and serial killers that 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 kill under the pretense that they're doing this under vampiric qualities, we also have people who have aligned themselves with werewolf lore and have done you know these kind of murders and going as far as eating brains and things like that. So. The crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, continues with Werewolf Talk on Spaced Out Radio right after this break. Stay tuned. The guru returns right after this. All right, we're clear. All righty. I could read this all day long. I, this is my favorite part. The, the comments. Love the comments. Yeah, they're good people. We're up to, uh, what are we up to? Well, just, we're at 188 on YouTube right now. All right. 
We were at 190, but a couple dropped out for the commercial. They'll be back. Yeah. All right, my friend. How long do we have? I'm going to go get a uh, drink of water. You got about four and a half minutes. Four, wow. Holy cow. You uh, got time. Yeah, I got time. I'll be right back. Mm-hmm. You got time. You got time. Now you guys are stuck here with me. NorCal Detecting, what is going on? Welcome to our chat room. All right. And uh, Super Duke. How's Super Duke from World Bigfoot Radio? If you're not signed up for World Bigfoot Radio here on Instagram, you need to do that. You need to. Why not? Remember, if you have any questions for the guru, please put them in capital letters if you're in one of our chat rooms. If you're new to this channel and wondering what the Sam Hill is going on, why is it the show going on? Because uh, we have to time out for our terrestrial radio stations. So we have to take breaks in order to uh, appease them. Uh, we're on six radio stations around North America. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but I'm pretty happy about that. Hopefully one day we'll get some more. And But that's kind of what we're doing here. So uh, you guys kind of get the behind the scenes of everything whether you're listening on our Spreaker feed like Revolution Radio or KPNL or whether on the YouTube or Twitch feed, you get the behind the scenes look at everything. Hello, gorgeous DM. How are you? She is a Red Deer Rebel. That's for sure. And um, yeah, the guru is awesome. The guru is awesome. I heard my name being called and I had to come back. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> we, we, got, we still got time, brother. Okay, cool. We still got time. Mennonite Abe, how's the fire going? Uh, the fires, uh, the one below me is um, <clears throat> um, just trying to think. It's about 18 miles from me. Um, watching the helicopters battle it all day long. Um, yeah. The gorgeous and talented uh, Jessica McCreary says, Hello, Crypto Guru. I'm originally from Indiana, Pennsylvania, and grew up there. You are an amazing guest. Well, it's, it's odd because, Jessica, I don't I don't know if you and I had ever met, uh, but um, the, my first encounter with what would be called, you know, my first Bigfoot encounter, uh, and the first time I ever met Eric Oldman was up in Indiana, PA, up in White's Woods. Where are you at now, Jessica? We'll get her to find out. All right. Tall Drath. And is she single? I'm not Tall sure. Tall <laughs> <laughs> Yes, ladies. Just so you know, if you're in the Pennsylvania area, the guru is looking for a date. <laughs> he is looking for a date. Hey, Sean, how you doing? All right. Uh, we will get to your questions when we come back from the break here. Um, you know, Ron, when you mentioned, uh, that guy who thought he was a werewolf and killed his neighbor who he thought was a vampire, mm -hmm. you know, that's also sounding more like meth and psychosis. Well, sure. You know, and that's the thing, right? We are in the 21st century. There are so many things that are happening now, like the idea of the zombies down in Florida because they were taking, uh, you know, bath salts and everything. The idea of a transformation now occurring in your head with enough power to really amp up your body. Um, it, it's scary. I mean, these are the modern realities of what's going on. These are the modern monsters that make me more scared than an actual werewolf. Yeah, I hear you there. All right, we just got a few more seconds here uh, coming up here. Uh, let's see here. Uh we got to cover that though. Some one of your people asked about uh, killing uh, the uh, a werewolf with a silver bullet. We'll have to go over that. And then somebody else asked a question on there as well too. And I don't know exactly where it was. Gosh darn it! Yes, uh, Jenny White Bear, I did get your uh, ma your message on Instagram. 
I will pass that on to the team. Big thank you to Andrew times two, Michael times three, Ed, Betty, Snakes, Murray for the super chats tonight. Here we go with the second half of the show starting right now. Second half of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. We want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. The guru is here, the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy. We're talking werewolves and dogman all night long. Ronald L. Murphy Jr. on Amazon. If you want to check out any of his books, which I highly suggest you do, you'd be really, really worth your book collection to have his team of books up on your shelves. Ron, welcome back. Hey, thank you very much, my friend. And, and look how quickly everything is going. I mean, it seems like we just started the show and just flies by. I hear you. Todd is asking, are there any accounts of someone actually seeing a werewolf transformation? There, there are. And it's so strange because Jenny White Bear, I was just reading about this. Uh, she said she worked in a psych uh, facility Okay, so Jenny, hold on here for one second because if you could type in this, we'll relay to what's going on. So the first time that I ever spoke with somebody concerning a transformation was a gentleman that worked as an orderly in a psychiatric, psychiatric hospital in upstate New York. He claimed that it was the night of a full moon and there was a patient there who was telling everybody that he was going to transform into a wolf. Whenever the full moon came about, uh, the, the, this, this gentleman started to attack people to the point that he act, actually had to be restrained. Um, the, uh, the gentleman that I spoke with said that the, uh, the patient had um, unnatural strength is the way that he described it. And he said that the body, the, the, the face contorted and the body contorted in such a way that it seemed almost unnatural. But the, the, the visage of the person did take on a very animalistic point of view. But it was not like the transformation that you would see in a movie, unfortunately. Now, I will tell you this. The way woodcuts were often done in the Middle Ages to show somebody being a werewolf was showing them with disheveled hair and unkept clothing. Because what the artist was trying to relate is that this person was not in the right mind and were not capable of taking care of themselves. So the long tradition that this is actually lunacy, you know, where we get the term again, it, it is well documented. So the idea of somebody transforming into a, a, an actual wolf, I've never heard of. But the idea of somebody believing that they're transforming into a, into a werewolf, I've heard on many, many occasions. Awesome. Let's go to another question here. And this one comes from Talderath, seeker of truth. How do you actually kill a werewolf? Perfect, perfect, perfect. I was hoping we would get to this, okay? So some people claim that we would use silver, okay? Now, why silver? Um, I've done extensive research on silver and it seems that one of the mystical qualities of silver is not only does it have the, the, the aspect of a full moon to it, but the coloring is halfway between white and black. So it kind of straddles two different worlds. So that's the metaphysical quality of silver. But there's also a very rational reason for silver as well, too. And it's used as an antibiotic in many uh, cultures around the world. Um, so it has a curative process as well. Um, but the idea of keeping things that like fairies and vampires and werewolves, creatures of the night away, 
Um, silver was definitely the way to go. Um, we go back, I, I, we have to talk about this, one of my favorite cases, one of the best documented cases of all, uh, the Beast of Gévaudan. Uh, this was in um, the, uh, the, the later 1700s, 1760s. Um, so whenever George Washington was fighting down here uh, on the side of the British against the French and Indians uh, over in um, rural uh, France, there was killings by some sort of very, very large animal that many believe was a werewolf. Um, I have heard reports of upwards of 400 people were killed by this animal. So many people were being preyed upon that King Louis XV himself sent his royal huntsmen after this creature. Um, there were a lot of wolves killed. Um, there were actually two very large wolves that were killed, one that went almost 200 pounds, which is almost unheard of. Um, but the actual creature that was uh, that killed to the point that the slaying stopped was shot by somebody by the name of Jean Chastel, and he used a silver bullet. Uh, it was actually melted down um, uh, uh uh, amulets uh, from the Virgin Mary uh, that people would wear as talismans. The, he melted these down and they were made of silver and he made this into a bullet and that's what took out this beast and that's whenever the predation stopped uh, in uh, Gévaudan in, uh, in France. One of my favorite stories, my friend, um, nobody knows exactly what was going on there um, but there were people being attacked um, sometimes three and four people at a time um, people had said it looked like a wolf, but wasn't a wolf. Uh, one person said it was as large as a cow. Um, nobody really knew what was going on. Now, our buddy John Chastel is an interesting character uh, because this is the age of enlightenment. And to prove that you were erudite, to prove that you were an intelligent person, uh, you would have a library. And if you had the wherewithal, you would also have yourself a menagerie, which was your own private zoo. It just so happened that our friend Jean uh, Chastel did have his own private zoo, and in that zoo he had a hyena. Now it's very possible in the in the tumult that was going on in um, France at the time that he unleashed one of his animals onto the countryside, so he would be able to get the money for killing it. And by the money, I'm talking about a vast amount of money. I'm talking about money to keep you and your family's family comfortable for generations. Um, so it's very possible that he let this beast loose and then in turn came out to be the hero. However, of course, this is a world of speculation as well. It has been speculated that somebody in John Chastel's family actually was the werewolf himself and, uh, and and Chastel knew about this that was going on and to kind of put him out of his misery he shot his own family member great great story of course there's nothing to uh, authenticate it uh, but we live in the world of conjecture anyways Dave so this makes a great story very true very true and we love your stories crypto guru Lori is asking could the dog buried in the churchyard be an Irish wolfhound. They were huge way back then. Absolutely. You know, the, the other thing, too, I, I wanted to, uh, in about 1200, you know, early 1200s, um, uh, St. Francis of Assisi uh, came to a town in Italy called Gubbio, and he was supposed to have uh, encountered a very monstrous wolf there as well. Uh, that had all the characteristics and all the uh, telltale signs of being a werewolf. Um, and that animal was buried under the altar of the church, and it too was quite large. So I think in St. Francis' uh, case, the idea of the church grim and the werewolf was kind of conflated together and had its, its own little legend. But I would think that if you would have um, a dog in life that was a very loyal companion, and it definitely, you know, it served its purpose and it's passed its time, that this was the last gift that you could give it by burying it in the churchyard. I don't think that people were so animalistic that they were killing dogs and sacrifices and going back to old pagan practices. I think that you necessarily had to have dogs as guardians against grave robbers and against, you know, against wolves because 
Wolves will go in and dig up freshly uh, buried bodies and have no problem feasting on that as carrion. So, you know, you would have these big dogs. And I think that the idea of the folklore and the legends all came together by having these dogs as protectors of the churches, and they in turn became the church grims. Awesome. Appreciate that. Help, please. First time in our chat room to thank you so much for coming in. Can there be other dogmen species? For example, bulldog men. I don't, <laughs> I don't think that we've ever had a Chihuahua dog man or anything like that. Um, interesting. I don't think that there's transformation going on the basis of species, uh, but I will definitely look into that. And if there's ever a poodle dog man out there or a, go a golden doodle dog man, I will definitely let you know and report it on the next Space Out Radio. Nikki is asking, where did the term lichen come from? Okay, so lycanthropy comes from, so a lot of these great terms become very eponymous. So it's based upon somebody's name. So we have a great king by the name of Laicon, where we get the name lichen from. So he was a king of a place called Arcadia. And this was a very, very backwoods area of Greece. Now, remember, when we talk about Greece, we talk about city-states. So we talk about Athens, and we talk about Sparta. And in these places was also a place called Arcadia, which, again, like I said, was the backwoods part of, uh, of, uh, of Greece. As the story goes, um, Zeus would sometimes take human form and visit people. Um, he visited uh, Lycaon here uh, in Arcadia, and Lycaon didn't believe that Zeus was omniscient, so he killed his own son. Lycaon killed his own son and made him into a meat pie so the god could eat it and to find out if he was omniscient, to know what he was eating. So, of course, Zeus knew what was going on. According to some tells, he resurrected the boy. But as the curse to Lycaon and his bloodthirstiness, he changed him into the very first werewolf. And that's where we get that term from. Now, what's so interesting about Arcadia, and I really want to look into this more, not only do the Greeks, but the Romans have many stories that come out of that place. Now, remember, it was it was backwoods because it was literally the woods. This was a very uncivilized area. Um, and many, many reports of werewolves come out of that area for, you know, over a thousand years. We have the Lycaea games that come out of there, which was loosely based upon the name of Lycon, Lycaon as well, too. Um, we have the idea of... Uh, once a year, a cult would gather there. Uh, one of its members would turn into a werewolf. Um, just a really neat place full of werewolf lore. Awesome. Awesome. Bomber is asking, are there any female bipedal canines ever witnessed with breasts like Patty the Sasquatch? You know, it, you know usually, and I'll tell you, Bomber, if there are reports of things out there with breast, I would know all about this. I've never heard of a report concerning um, a canid uh, with the breast like Patty. I've not. I've not. I wish that I had, but none here, my friend. Why do you think that is? Um, I don't think that people would report it. Um, I think that the idea of seeing pendulous breast, and if it wasn't on Patty, if that wasn't so prominent on that Bigfoot creature in the Patterson, Patterson Gimlin film, I don't think that people would normally bring that up. We still have our social mores to us. We're still very Victorian in our prim and proper way when we talk to other people. So I think that when we, we encounter something like that, we're not going to bring that up so readily simply because it's something to be more hushed, hushed. All right. Let us go to the next question here. And in Australia is asking, do you know if they have red eyes? Well, absolutely. So that is one of the things that is almost continual uh, in the reports of werewolves. The idea of these eyes that are in its human form, um, you know, almost yellowish, you know, as if there is some sort of uh, medical problem going on. Um, so the transformation process then takes you up to the idea where these creatures have these 
ungodly red eyes, or some people describe them as if brimstone was burning within the sockets of their heads. So people have been reporting red eyes for 2,000 years probably on these creatures. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty insane. Pretty and, insane. And um, you said earlier, Dave, about that as well, too, about uh, modern werewolf reports. Um, one report in Ligonier, Pennsylvania, which is about 15 minutes down the road from where I live, um, there was a report of a creature staring some at somebody uh, from the woods as they unloaded their car to taking groceries from the store. And that was one of the things that was so uh, was standing out so much that even though it was twilight, these red eyes seemed to glow with an unworldly light as if they were self-illuminated, staring at these people as they put uh, their groceries away. That's not the first time I've heard that. Bush Wachowski also had a report about something along those lines. Ron, I can believe in Dogman. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I know people who've seen this creature. Uh, I've met of quite a few of them, talked to quite a few of them. All right. But the werewolf thing, I have real troubles believing outside of psychosis mm -hmm. until we actually. And look, I'm pretty open minded when it comes to the woo, man. I'm very open minded when it comes to the woo. But this is just one of those hard pills to swallow that I'm just not sure truly exists right. outside of some sort of psychosis yes. that someone has when a full moon comes around. Right. And, and I agree with you 100% about that because you have to imagine that there is some sort of chemical process in your body that it would allow it to um, uh, supersede what is already there. You know, you're, you're talking about DNA realigning itself and you're talking about really hardcore, um, you know, science that would have to, to go on to transform somebody else into, or just transform somebody into a, an animal form. Now, that being said, the idea that it occurs in the mind makes the transformation process extremely genuine for the person that is imagining it. Okay. So I think that that is probably one of those, those, those sticking points. These people that are believing they're actually transforming into a wolf are doing absolutely insane things to their fellow human beings. And they have no conscience whatsoever in regards to these inhumane acts. And because they have imagined they have become werewolves, I think it's enough to me to accept that they are then indeed werewolves, even though there's not a transformation that has occurred. I think they're still just as dangerous, and it's still just as fascinating as a world to study and to investigate as if they did transform into an animal. I think they still have little padded rooms for yes, people like this. Yes. Well, that is the thing, right? And and, and that is what's been going on. And, and and I really I really want to end the conversation and to end my book that I wrote on Dogman and saying it is just lunacy. It is one of those things that's part of the human condition. Um, it is a psychosis. But gosh darn it, you know, I look at these cave paintings that date back 35,000 years where it shows a human being transforming into an animal. Or whenever I look at the, uh, the god Anubis that is transforming into an animal by putting the head on. And indeed, I will tell you, we do have representations of Anubis without the jackal headed the, the 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 jackal head on so the egyptians believed that it was able to transform as well too um and again that 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 instances with the uh the mississippian cultures uh in in ohio of them going in there and actually taking the human face apart in order to make it more wolf-like there is still that unknown that drags me back, Dave, that says there's something actually happening. And even though that makes no sense to me scientifically, something's telling me there's more to it than meets the eye. All right. Solar Warden is asking, are you familiar, Rono, with the Montauk monster? 
Was it a biological experiment or a crypto creature? Okay, so we can talk about this thing. This is a show in and of itself. So the Montauk Monster, is it a raccoon? A lot of people say it's a raccoon. It doesn't look at all like a raccoon to me, Dave. Does it look like a raccoon to you? No. No. It looks as if that, especially considering that island off, 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 offshore, that there's probably some sort of genetic testing going on, and occasionally from time to time something escapes. If, if somebody told me that the government is, is doing genetic testing on animals, I would not bat an eye because I'm sure it's going on. But the idea that there's more going on than meets the eye, um, kind of like um, an Island of Dr. Moreau thing going on, I think that we're at that stage of believability. Look, the Russians were doing this in, in, in during the World War II and during the Cold War, where they were doing you know outrageous things, splicing two heads onto a dog and experimenting with apes. Now, you know that was uh, uh, you know 60, 70 years ago. Think about now what we're capable of doing with our technologies. Well, without a doubt, our government and governments around the world are doing genetic testing and tweaking and everything else. Um, and there is definitely more to the Montauk monster than just a washed up uh, raccoon. Definitely. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist either. I'm not. I mean, I look at everything very skeptical, uh, but I would just have to say that so much weird stuff is coming from that place that none of this is making any sense. And you're not going to just say it's tip. It's just simply a, uh, a, a, a raccoon. But isn't this all part of the debate where we try and figure out what is real and what is fake? People are having these major experiences. I, I think people, if you hear one person say it, okay, it, it's, it could be imagination. Mm -hmm. Their eyes see something different, especially at night. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when you get numerous people explaining the same creature over and over again, guru, mm -hmm. I mean, that just has to you know, pump some air into the, or, or some fuel on the fire to really help it, this, this explode in, in that there is something out there that we got to find out. Yeah. yeah. And the thing that I keep on bringing up in my research is the idea that I'll keep on saying again and again is the term continuity. Um, in order to be something to know that there's something out there, there has to be a continuation of what's going on. Now, what happens to in our modern era is that there's the idea of, um, of uh, you know, of, of kind of negative propaganda as well, too. So if something would get out there and we say, this is not a raccoon, something else is going on. Now there's this kind of anti-propaganda that goes on and says that everybody believes that now are crazy or they're in the fringe. So a lot of that goes on as well, too. So we have to be very careful. We have to straddle a very fine line, don't we? Because just like those werewolves in the, you know, in the ancient past that were considered to be lunatics and nuts, it's very easy for mainstream science to call us that as well if we do not look at both sides. But again, at the end of the day, there's so much out there that, that it just doesn't make any sense to me. And there's more going out there than, than meets the eye. It has to. Well, we're going to find out. And we literally have you for another 30 minutes here on Spaced Out Radio as we wrap up our number two. I'm telling you, Guru, you're going to have to come back next month. Hey, you know what? We can start doing a monthly one if you want. Um, I know that I was going through a lot of stuff with work and everything. Um, I, I would only be able to do Fridays, but if you want to have me come on back on, and man, I will be here at a moment's notice. Well, you know what? I just happen to have a Friday available in August. No, uh, then count me in, my friend. Count uh, me in. Yeah, if you're in our audience, in our chat rooms, if you need more guru time next month, you let us know as we wrap up our number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. We got the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, for another 30 minutes. Then we're going to bring in John Hudson for the latest UFO news, the Newswire, and the Thought of the Dave. Stay tuned. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this. All right. Um, 
Put the twentieth on your calendar. All right, I will do that right now. All right. Perfect. All right, I'm just going to run my dogs out. I'll be right back. Okay, uh, bud. I'll let you uh, chat with the audience. Well, Hello, right. gorgeous lots. How are you? Radio head, welcome to the show. All right. Guru, it's all yours, buddy. Uh, this is what one of my work. favorite parts. My favorite parts. Let's see here. Betty Spaghetti. I saw one once when I was walking my dog out in the middle of the night. So I would love to hear that report, Betty. Um, listen, hey, guys. Um, I am on Facebook as well, too. Let me tell you what my Facebook thing is here because I forget sometimes. Um, so my Facebook page is named, oh, Ronald Murphy. That's real original. Uh, you go to Ronald Murphy uh, and friend me, or you could go to Ronald L. Murphy Jr. and you could like my uh, my author page as well, too. But guys, honest to goodness, I love to hear from you. I love to hear your reports. Um, I would gladly interact with you guys uh, because I really am trying to get to the bottom of this stuff. And not only am I trying to get to the bottom of this stuff, is I'm a fan as well, too. I'm a big fan of Bigfoot. I'm a big fan of all this stuff. I want to hear your theories because, remember, there's no expert in this field whatsoever. So, you know, reach out to me. I, I, if you're coming up and telling me that you've had experiences, I definitely want to hear these experiences. Um, let's see here. Uh, Eve is half sleeping. Eve, it might be time to go to bed, unfortunately. Um, let's see what else we have on here. Um, let's see. So Andrew and Gnome's Trucking Express. I love the name of Gnome's Trucking Express. You saw some experiences. Um, yes, let's see. What? Oh, Apollo 11. So what lake monster cryptos uh, or in North America. Interestingly, I just wrote a book. Well, not just wrote a book, but two years ago, I wrote a book called um, uh, On Aquatic Monsters of the Great Lakes. So I look at every great lake and I go into detail about some of the uh, monsters that are up there. Um, I love the idea of sea monsters. I love the idea of water monsters. And I think I did a pretty good job covering uh, that. So if you happen to get a chance, uh, you could check that out because uh, I really, and uh, it was actually, I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I actually um, liked the book very much. And uh, uh, Lauren Coleman out of the uh, Cryptozoological Museum up there in uh, in uh, Maine said that that was one of the best books uh, ever written on lake monsters. And I was very pleased. So yeah, on aquatic monsters of the Great Lakes. Um Oh, Ed, I am very, very honored. Butch is good, but Guru is the bomb. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, I appreciate all that. And so you wouldn't mind me then coming back next month. I, I used to be a regular on Dave's program, you know, for years. I was on here once a month. But then I thought, you know, do you really want to see and hear me once a month? Because I would assume uh, people would get sick of me. Um, ufologists in Hawaii is the Menahune. Um, in my book uh, on uh, on wild men, I have a whole section on the Menahune. Um, and also, uh, I deal with them a bit in my uh, On Fairies book as well, too. Um, yes, the Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Um, also, uh, it's strange. Uh, we don't think about this kind of stuff. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, uh, military uh, around Loch Ness up in the Highlands of Scotland as well, too. Um, so one of my theories is that the military comes to these places um, because there is something otherworldly about them. Um, it's not a coincidence that they show up in these areas, but I think they're there more out of research or I'm a great believer in the idea of ley lines as well, too. And the Earth has natural occurring energy pockets. And that's very possible why the military find these places so interesting. Yeah, White's Woods was too creepy. And Blue Spruce Park used to creep me out as well, too. Um, always felt like someone watching lived in Pittsburgh for long. Jessica McCreary, you're in Ohio now. It's a shame. Have you heard of a brownness in the Lake District? Yes, uh, lots. Uh, yeah. I would love to come on and talk about more about uh, 
uh, Lake Monsters as well, too. I think it's fascinating. When we talk about continuity, that is Lake Monsters is one of the most continuous uh, going cryptids around. Hey, Guru. How you doing? Hey, good, good, good. These guys are unbelievable. They have awesome, awesome questions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's why it's Guru time, my friend. That's right. That's right. People are already wanting to have shows on Lake Monsters, which would be an awesome show. Um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we'll get it going, man. We'll get it going. Uh, John Hudson, if you're listening, I'm sending you the link. Right now, I apologize that I didn't send it earlier, brother. All right. Um, good stuff, man. It is. Good stuff. P Peter F., how you doing? Uh, somebody said they're near the Bridgewater Triangle. I have to get up there. Uh, let's see who was that. Let me just see here real quick. Uh, Lauren, I'm by the Bridgewater Triangle. I've seen huge things in the lake. Hey, if you want to get in touch with me somehow, because I would like to do a uh, research uh, investigation up there. So get in touch with me some way, Lauren. Thank you to Cat Chaser for the super chats and everybody else. Here we go with our three. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears, especially if you're tuning on in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Ellie Triferous. Ellie Triferous is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce Ronald L. Murphy Jr., otherwise known around these parts as the Crypto Guru, and we've been talking wolf, well, werewolves and... Dog man all night long. Got to ask you, Ron, before we get back to audience questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Is there a tie-in between dog man, werewolf, and Sasquatch? I, I think, I, I truly think going back through, you know, 200 years of, of incident reports um, that there has been a confusion over many things. Uh, sometimes people see Bigfoot and it doesn't act like Bigfoot in a lot of the old reports. You know, Dave, um, that there were occasions in reports from the early to mid 1800s where the creature that we describe or what we would, they would describe, we would describe as Bigfoot now were seen as wild men that were sometimes seen wearing clothes or remnants of clothes. Very, very strange. Um, it leads to the, the idea that we might be dealing with, you know, a transformation process or getting back to your assumptions as well, too. We could indeed be dealing with a wild man, somebody that had some sort of psychological problems and went feral. Very, very possible. But I think that there is definitely a connection between Bigfoot and wild man. Now, one of the problems is, is if these creatures are indeed flesh and blood animals, how could two apex predators overlap uh, the same area and vie for very limited, uh, you know, supplies? That's one of the problems that I have with this. But, uh, you know, we can work that out later because uh, I think going back to the, my buddy Sam Sherry that said there were two types of Bigfoot out there. Uh, one was the big lumbering giant and the other one was the, the muzzle-shaped uh, uh, grassel type of uh, creature. I think that he was witnessing a dog man and a Bigfoot in a very uh, specific area. 
I think so too. And, and you know, there's not a lot of reports out there. And I've talked to Duke from World Bigfoot Radio and other uh, good people in the Bigfoot world who have taken a look seriously at this creature. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of confrontation mm -hmm. between these two, whether Sasquatch is a little bit more uh, passive on its own area or terrain, whereas Dogman seems to be a lot more standoffish, if we could use that term. Yeah. No, I think that, that is the thing. I, I think that, and that's quite plausible. Um, is Bigfoot the type of a creature that basically um, allows this, this, this creature to have its way in a particular territory and it assumes another territory that it completely moves on? It's very possible that we're dealing with something that's very nomadic too, is, is, uh, involving Bigfoot. And the Dogman seems to be very... Um, specific to locations as if it sticks around in that area. Um, so it's very possible that a Bigfoot and a Dogman will encounter, encounter each other very irregularly just simply because their 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 natural habitats and their natural inclinations to the way they, they interact within the environment. Who wins in a fight? Because I'm telling you right now, I will pay the $59.95 for the pay-per-view Oh, yeah. Of that match yeah. between Bigfoot and Dogman. Yeah. Who wins? Well, I think that if you put, I mean, both these creatures, Bigfoot, you know, eight foot tall, you know, eight to twelve hundred pounds, and the 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 uh dogman seven foot tall, you know, four hundred pounds, Bigfoot got him by you know double the weight. But we're dealing with an animal here that has ripping teeth, you know terrible canines and in and these vast talons i think that the uh the dog man would probably win uh within uh within one round unfortunately no way i'm going bigfoot all You're going the way bigfoot. is that right straight, so, yeah. straight power and brawn my friend okay power and brawn and you know what sasquatch doesn't eat breakfast for dinner <laughs> dog man does <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, I, there's precedent in the natural world where we say things like the Velociraptor simply because it had the long talons and the slashing kind of claws could disembowel very, very large animals. So that is my thing that I think that that, that Bigfoot would come in for an attack and the Dogman would simply, um, you know, juke and disembowel it right there with its talons. I, I don't think so. I think that there's too much power and force that if uh, Sasquatch ever got a hold of Dogman, that literally he'd squeeze the thing to death. I, I, I would slam like to it, it, slam it against a tree, much like it does with feral hogs. Uh, and I would hope, I would hope that that would happen because I would much rather run into a Bigfoot than a Dogman. So would I. Yep. So would I. But I still think that that Bigfoot wins that one. I, 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 you know what? I will say that I wouldn't think that he would, but I hope that he would. I hope so too. Yeah. I hope so too, my friend, as we continue on with the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy tonight. Now, do you, speaking of Bigfoot versus Dogman, you know, in Pennsylvania, you have the bipedal canine that a lot of people are seeing. Ohio and Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana seem to have the Dogman reports quite frequently out there. Are you surprised we're not seeing more interaction between the two giant creatures? Oh, absolutely. I, I do. And I think that one of the reasons why we're not seeing more interaction is because we are not witnessing, uh, the eyewitnesses are not seeing two different things. I think that, especially when the idea of the, uh, the Ohio grass man, uh, oftentimes, this is one of those Bigfoot creatures that is unusually violent towards people or unusually aggressive. And you get into the South, too, whenever you talk about the skunk ape and you talk about, you know, all these other creatures down there that inhabit areas around Louisiana and Alabama where they're very aggressive creatures. I don't think that we're talking about Bigfoot at all. I think that we are talking more along the lines of a dogman cryptid, and that is what the confusion is. I think that a lot of times people are seeing one thing and they're misinterpreting it for something totally different. Peter is asking, what's the likelihood of Dogman or Bigfoot being responsible for unexplained disappearances? Yeah, 100%. I mean, if these are, again, we will go this way. If these are indeed flesh and blood animals 
and they are you know as people say that they're, they're they, they they dwell in the woods they try to be um you know uh, elusive they don't want to have interaction with people but again what happens whenever the inevitable happens and they cross paths with a with a human being i think that if these creatures are flesh and blood 100 percent they are responsible for at least a fraction of disappearances without a doubt do you think this is possibly the secret behind a lot of these missing 411 cases. Absolutely. I mean, there is no other explanation. I have been to places, I've been to places where people have turned up missing. I've investigated in the, in the Scottish Highlands. Uh, I've investigated in places in New Brunswick that is, you know, very impenetrable. In the places around Sault Ste. Marie and uh, in Michigan and places in Maine that are impenetrable. Um, and people can go missing but the numbers that we're talking about dave the sheer numbers the reason we should be tripping over bodies because a lot of these times people are going missing in very um specific locations you know there's almost um a groundswell of activity in a very Con, con, you know, precise area. So precise that if we would go in there and people were dying of natural causes, we would readily be able to find their bodies. But we're not. Something is going on out of the ordinary that is physically taking these people so that we cannot find them. That That is, that is my assumption that is going on, and that is my conclusion that I've made by not only reading and watching the, the missing 911 cases, uh, but also doing my uh, my own research as well. See, the, the weird part for me is how far the people get, whether it's a child, whether it's an elderly person, or even somebody healthy and spry in between, how far they get from their original location. Right. You know, whether they're found dead or alive, when you see someone like a two-year-old child 24 hours later found 12 miles away a two-year-old child is not going to do that absolutely not um what not only those cases which are very very uh you know pertinent in in, in my understanding that there's something going out there uh but also whenever they will find the person's gear like their backpack within sight of a house or their thermos up on a rock that's overlooking a highway. It looks as if there's something out there toying with us and they know that we are looking for them, but they're one step ahead of the game. All right. Jennifer is asking, Guru, do you think that Cynocephaly warriors of Lycia and Canaan, a dogman species or just an analogy? Oh, uh, excellent question. So we could look at the writings and this goes back to Pausanias who was one of the great Greek travel writers. We can go back to Herodotus, who, you know, his, his history is really what gave us uh, the name for history to this day, who wrote about this kind of stuff. But when we go into the Roman period, even Livy report, reported about these uh, these areas that were specific to uh, 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 Cenocephaly. Um, India, uh, especially, was a place that was supposed to be very rife with this as well, too. So... In, in very, very quick, uh, I'll, I'll sum this up quickly. I think that we were dealing with a genetic disease called uh, hypertrichosis, which causes a lot of hair on the human bodies. Um, and there were people that were being uh, given up uh, and left in the woods. And they would not only find each other, but would be taken in by these groups of people that um, uh, exhibited uh, this type of... Uh, of uh, phenotypical uh, output of hair. And that is where these legends derive from. Uh, I know that that is kind of um, a hard thing to swallow and kind of scientific and probably not doesn't have much woo in it. Um, but I think that what would happen is children will be formed with what would be deemed a, uh, uh, an abnormality uh, or some sort of deformity, and they would be left out in the woods 
And the people that were left out in subsequent generations knew that this would happen and they would take the, this child into their own fold and they would be self perpetrate, uh, you know, perpetuating. So places like India, places like, uh, um, uh, the middle East in pockets would have these, these groups of people that suffer from hypertrichosis. And that's where a lot of these dogman legends came from. B Hoff is asking, has anyone ever attempted to trap a dog man? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was going to say mountain monster guys <laughs> trying to do that, but like you're talking about legitimately. Absolutely. So my buddy, uh, I call him my buddy now because I spent one day with him, uh, Sam Sherry. Um, he made um, uh, these kind of uh, um, adjunct traps trying to catch not only Bigfoot, but also these dogman creatures that he was talking about too. He saw them just as another species of uh, Bigfoot. Yeah, but people will try it. I mean, there's there's traps out there in the woods right now, uh, things that are as simple as bear traps up to something that more like a Rube Goldberg type of apparatus. But people are trying to capture these things, absolutely. Anybody been even close to being successful? Um, you know what? I don't think so. Um, but 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 let's play the devil's advocate as well, too. What happens if somebody does capture one of these creatures? Who do you call? True. And if you call the authorities, what happens to your creature that you caught? See, that that's one of the things that gets me as well, too. Um, it's very possible that we these things have been captured. These things have been killed, uh, that they've ended up hit by cars. But what happens whenever we notify somebody that these creatures have been found or caught or killed? Um, I mean, does an agency come in and whisk these things away? Um, I kind of think that that happens. I kind of think that we have a government um, secret agency going out there. And again, I'm not a conspiracy nut. I'm just telling you that I feel that that if something like this would happen, somebody would step in and remove the evidence simply because they would think that we're not ready to believe in this. And also, what do we then do now with our national park systems and everything that do people then stop going out into the wilderness? So it, it impacts uh, the economy as well too. So I think that, uh, you know, the powers that be uh, are looking out for the sheep because they don't believe that we're capable of assimilating these kind of things into our daily lives. Very true. We've got about six minutes left with you tonight, crypto guru. We're going to continue with some audience questions here. You know, if you were to trap one or try and trap even a Sasquatch, what would be your method? What would you do? Uh, well, this the, I know that people have used, um, uh, and this is very ingenious as well, too, to use something that requires a hand to get into, that you would have to open something up or unscrew it. Now, we're not talking about capturing the creature bodily, although some people do that. We're talking about trying to obtain DNA evidence. So I've seen people put um, a, a can inside of a nest of barbed wire where you'd have to kind of slide your hand in there, hoping that some hair would be removed as the creature pulls its hand away. But I've also seen traps that were designed to lower or to trap something in almost um, steel cable as well, too. That, you know, a bear trap would catch onto the leg. And there's no way that you're going to be able to pull this out because the steel cable is tied to a tree or what have you. I don't think those things are going to work. I think that you're dealing with a very intelligent animal that is elusive and self-aware, and it's not going to fall into any of these kind of typical tracks uh, or these typical traps. Although I do like the idea of putting out bait that requires you uh, manipulation to open. I think that that is going in the right direction. See, I think the gifting site is one of the right. only ways to do it. I don't think you can trap them. Mm -hmm. I think they are way too smart. I mean, we're dealing with creatures here that have a strange sense of, or maybe it's hearing of technology for I game mean, cams and for anything else that's out there. And and this is what concerns me about trapping them. I don't think you can. I think the, that a Sasquatch or probably even a dog man is 
strong enough to rip any type of cable or snap any type of cable. Uh, I, I think that they, they have this innate ability to smell gunpowder from a long ways away, let alone hearing shots. Mm. No. Yeah, I know. I think that what you're saying, I, I take a lot of credence in what you say. I think our technology has gotten to the point right now where it gives off something, some sort of uh, sound, some sort of um, infrared signal, something. Um, it's interesting that whenever we talk about the Patterson-Gimlin film, that that was caught on tape, you know, and people were saying that we're not catching things on our digital cameras or, you know, the, the, the game cams that are out now aren't catching anything. And I think that is, well, there's, there's several things that could be going on. Uh, number one is that these creatures simply know from the smell, from the sound, from the visualization that of the, of the power source that might be coming up, because we don't understand what kind of spectrum these creatures see. And it's very possible they see the power being emitted by these things that we aren't aware that's there. Um, the other thing that I have to point out is that even if these creatures are flesh and blood, you know, let's just say they are completely flesh and blood, are they living in the same type of sp spectrum that we live in? You know, are they of this dimension? Do they slide in and out? People talk about cloaking. You know, are they of an element that is simply impervious to being picked up on digital equipment? That's a possibility as well. I agree with you. Yeah. I totally agree with you. As time starts to wind down, we got about two minutes, 45 seconds. For people who want to go looking for Dogman or Bigfoot, and at least be safe about it. What do you recommend? Uh, I, 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 I will tell you this, and I'm not being a, a party pooper, but I don't think that anybody should ever go looking for dogmen. Um, I, I regret my instance, you know, even though like, I came with some really extraordinary evidence and some very, very weird things happened to me, I don't think that anybody should go out there with their goal in mind to find a dog man. I think that's an absolute mistake. Um, Bigfoot is a different matter. Um, I think that what you need to do is whenever you go out into the woods, you have to go out very with a, with a very reverent mind uh, that you're open up to anything that would happen. Um, and you want to put out positivity out there. Um, I think that what you put out into the world will attract what you're, what's going in. So if you go out there with guns and you go out there with hostility in mind, you're only going to get hostility returned to you. Um, if you go out there with a very open mind and with a feeling of gratitude and with a feeling of sincere um, gratefulness, uh, that, the, um, that you may indeed have some sort of um, communion with this creature. Well, that, that makes for an interesting time. 90 seconds, my friend. Let everybody know where they can find your books and your website. Okay, well, I will tell you this. If anybody is in Pennsylvania or Ohio, uh, this time uh, next Friday, uh, it will be a full moon, and I will be doing a uh, two presentations. I will be doing a presentation on Bigfoot, and I will be doing a presentation on werewolves at um, very historic and very haunted Hillview Manor in um, uh, Newcastle, Pennsylvania. So that will be next Friday, a week from today, uh, under the full moon. We will be howling at the moon together. Um, if you want to read my books, you can go to Amazon.com. I have written a books on Bigfoot and on Dogman, of course, as well. Um, and also, I said uh, during break, uh, feel free to look me up on Facebook. Uh, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. is my author page, and Ronald Murphy is my regular page. Um, you know, reach out to me. Uh, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. at yahoo.com is my uh, email address. Uh, get in touch with me. You know, let's let's talk about the world of the uh, supernatural for a while. All right, Guru. We'll talk to you next month, August 20th. We're gonna be, uh, we are going to be having you as a monthly guest here talking all things strange and weird, and maybe next month we'll get into some sea monsters and legends. I'd, I'd love to talk about the Great Lakes, my friend. Let's do it. We'll talk about the Great Lakes next uh, next month, Dave. All right. The crypto guru, Ronald Murphy. Yeah, we love him around here. I told you that he was a fantastic, detailed storyteller if this was your first time getting guru time. Coming up next, we have the unbiased UFO report. We have... 
the Newswire, and the Thought of the Day. A jam-packed final half hour of Spaced Out Radio right after this. Boy, Guru got out of Dodge quite quickly. Whispers from the dark, welcome back. All right, John, if you're listening, come on in. Ah, Guru, uh, when you have five kids, you learn to uh, get as much sleep as you can when you can. Yeah, the one thing I love about the Guru guys is he can talk about anything. He's he, he's quite similar to Varla Ventura that way, another monthly feature guest that we have. And I think it's a great, great mix having both of them on the team and uh, love having them here. Love having them here. There, There's Stetson John. Check that hat out. Sub, That's buddy. A, just living the dream, bud. How about you? Doing good, doing good. Yeah, it was funny. It was actually, uh, I was starting to lose my hair. I was going to shave my head. My wife's like, hey, why don't I buy you some nice hats? So I was like, woohoo. There you go. Yeah, you don't want to shave that hair. You got, you got a gorgeous mane, man. You don't want to do that. Uh, every morning I see my daughter's hair and it makes me really miss mine. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I tell my son all the time I got better hair than him. <laughs> Thank you lots for that awesome super chat. Really appreciate that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, Guru Time is a great guest. We got some good UFO stuff tonight. We really do. That was a hell of a week to start. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, we got it. Hey, Gary, I know you're listening, buddy, because I see you just posted. That's how I know you're still here. Uh, any chance we could get uh, Wednesday night's uh, feature put on there? I, I got to talk to you about that, Gary. Um I don't know how late you're going to be up or if you just want to talk about it tomorrow, but I do have a, a question about it. So um, we can chat about that if you don't mind. I need yeah, I saw email. Mondays was up. Yeah, we put Mondays up. And you did well. You've, you've done very yeah, well. Sir, it was cool. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, I love that light thing you got going on in the back. <laughs> Oh yeah, Dogman would. Uh, Dogman is totally heavy metal. Dogman is heavy metal. Bigfoot's more hard rock. Dogman <clears throat> is totally thrown me off, man. Because like I, I wanted to like go out and look for a like Bigfoot seems like this big chewy like you know like forest oh, friend, yeah. and then Dogman comes into it and it's like ah, this is not a happy story anymore. I I want to you know leave. I mean it's like that's a mm -hmm. scary thing if it's real. Thanks, Andrew. Vinny is asking, is that Mike D from the Beastie Boys? That's funny. <laughs> I'll compliment. Uh huh. It's good times. Good times. Not a problem, Nicola. Thank you for listening. Yeah, you guys, honestly, uh, you'll fall in love with the guru. Uh, you really will. All well, right, he's fun because he's got a real storyteller's flair. Oh, yeah. He's an incredible storyteller. But he keeps it real, which is a rare combination. Fap, this is very true. Dave has better hair than any mammal since the Big Bang. Very true. All right. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate that. But I do have some questions about that for you. Uh, just something I'm not understanding on our YouTube channel. 
Justin S., what's happening? That's Bill fucking Murray, guys. Bill fucking Murray. This is my Chive t-shirt. Mm-hmm. So you got All that right, one for you. We got about 30 seconds here. Big thank you to Cat Chaser, Lots, Andrew times two, Michael times three, Ed, Betty, Fapster, Snakes, and Murray for the incredible super chats tonight. We really do appreciate the love. And we're going to get going here with some good old-fashioned Spaced Out Radio coming up here in about seven seconds. So sit tight, relax. We're going to get it going. Hey, Donald Stevens, welcome to the show. Final half hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features with you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's time once again for the unbiased UFO report. Every second day, we bring in John Hudson, our UFO reporter, to come on in and keep us up to date with all the UFO news that is going on around the world and john is one of the tops of what we are doing it's brand new feature on this show and we are loving it as it continues on tonight john welcome back thank you dave very very happy to be here how are you doing tonight i am doing great man very very well now dr bob mcguire on science bob and friends seemed to stir up a little bit of stuff on the ufo twitter world and got a lot of people pretty upset with him talking about this 23-minute video that Luis Elizondo and Danny Sheehan actually talked about on previous couple of podcasts earlier this week. Yeah, you know, and it's kind of funny because, um, you know, Bob played it, you know, really clean and um, was was very careful about what he said, you know, as he should be. And, um, and but the great part that he, the great tidbit that he gave us um, which was, you know, partially implied, um, was that essentially the the single frame, the single cell that he saw, that he spoke about many months ago of seeing a a, a very, 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 you know, uh, intense, um, very highly detailed photograph, is actually from the 23 minute video that Elizondo and uh, and Danny Sheehan have been talking about. And so while it was Luis Elizondo and Danny that had been actually you know, talking about the most, and they were the ones that had added the most, um, you know, uh, kind of graphic descriptions as to, you know, what kind of a video it was. Uh, it ended up being Bob that got a lot of the attention because of the fact that we were able to tie this one image that he saw, this one cell from the film, back to the actual three minute video, which, uh, you know, brings some brings more gravity to it. I mean, you know, nothing's conclusive right. yet, but I mean, it's it brings a lot more gravity to it. Now, we can only assume, and Bob didn't get into this, but we can only assume that's the video of the black triangle coming out of the water. That's, yes. And, and you know, and, and Bob, you know, went into a little bit more detail. Uh, you know, he did he did mention that, you know, from, from it was from his perspective of the picture, it looked like it might be a triangle. You know, you couldn't know for sure that it was a triangle. Um, we also have no way of knowing it. 23 minutes is a long time. I mean, you know, five other types of ships could have shown up that represent, you know, circles, squares, stars, and, and rectangles, and who knows, right? I mean, so, um, but but I think it's safe to assume that there was, a, there was a large triangle involved. And if you listen to what James Fox has said, um, this was a very large triangle. I mean, he, he's been quoted as saying it was a, a football field on an edge. 
And, uh, and if it really came out of the ocean without any, any effort, um, that alone is, is one hell of a thing to catch on film. Now, one of the things about this 23 minute film now I'll tell you, I first heard about that slide. Let me go like way back here. All right. I first heard about that triangle coming out of the water from another member of the NSA who, or the national security agency who I was having a phone conversation with him and his neighbor said, Hey, I know you're all into this weird stuff because the spooks all live side by side in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. And Stay at the same like, hotel. Have, have you heard about this photograph? And this photograph of this black triangle for people who don't know was literally circulated all around the intelligence agencies. Didn't matter whether you were NRO, NSA, CIA, military intelligence, it didn't matter. Everybody in an alphabet agency was looking at this. From what I heard, there was like there was out close to 12, 1500 people who got yeah, this was uh, the intelligence community's version of of going viral. Yes, absolutely. So with this 23 minute video, I've heard McGuire say it, Dr. McGuire, and I've heard Luis Elizondo say it that if this video ever came out, this would be conclusive proof to absolutely everyone everyone on this planet that there is an extraterrestrial presence here. Are you hearing that as that, well? That is, oh, absolutely. And, and uh, Danny Sheehan has alluded to that as well. And, and it's, it's, it's very interesting because, you know, we've all been able to watch most of them for long enough now that we're all starting to learn their body language and their tones and their cadence and, and, you know, how they speak. And uh, all of them, said um, something to that effect with such ease and with such confidence um, and, and almost with a little bit of, of, of mirth, you know, in the, in the, it was just, it's so unbelievably, you know, impactful that um, yeah, it, it's um, you know, it's unbelievably tantalizing. Is there any chance or are you hearing any rumblings that there might be portions of this video coming out? So, it's it's possible. The problem is, is that the, the location it was at when everyone who saw it claims to have seen it was essentially in a, you know, I mean, not to go into too much detail, but was in an air gap separated network. Right. So, um, you know, getting that um, out and getting that to the public is uh, is quite a maneuver. Um, you know, they have methods for even catching it if you film it off, you know, your laptop. Um, uh, there, there's methods for, for all sorts of stuff. So basically it would have to come out through official means, um, which is what uh, Elizondo had said the other night. Uh, and one of the challenges I have is that I don't know what the cost is, right? I don't know what the cost is of actually going through a video like that, of, like that and actually taking out all the proper artifacts and stitching it back together into a contiguous film. That might be a very expensive, very labor intensive uh, process. And I don't know who would pay for that. I don't know what, you know, what group would fund that. So I don't even know practically how it would happen. But my hope is, is that such a package, such a delivery would be um, delivered to members of Congress. And depending on which members of Congress get to see it, that incre increases the probability that we might. All right. I don't think that video will ever come out. We might get two seconds, maybe five. Yeah, I don't, I, I think, I think the picture I think the picture's got a shot. Um, I think the cell that Bob saw has a shot of getting out. But I but I'll be shocked if we if we ever see the film. All right. You've got some reaction to Luis Elizondo being number 68 in the most interesting people and topics of interest in People magazine's latest article. Did we ever think that we would have a UFO guy in People magazine? Not just a UFO guy, right? I mean I encourage people to listen to some of um, uh, uh, Ross uh, Col uh, Colthart's um, uh, recent interviews where he talks about the the research he did on, on, on Lou Elizondo, both in the United States and back in Australia, where he talked to, you know, intelligence professionals of the Australian armed forces who knew Elizondo and, and knew background. And this 
um, you know, this, this, this is a serious guy, right? I mean, he's done some pretty crazy stuff and for him to be on people magazine. I mean, I just, I, you know, and I, I saw an interview of him where someone brought it up and I, I mean, you could hear it in his voice. That guy was embarrassed beyond, um, I think it completely blindsided him. I really do. And, um, I'm sure his kids are having a ton of fun with it. Oh, if I was one of Elizondo's children right now, I would be at going up to him and say, "Hey, Dad, hey, Dad, can I get your autograph for this? You have oh, to for Christmas. He'd get oh, a yeah. big poster of it. <laughs> Everybody that Elizondo is working with or has worked with has probably oh. texted him in the last forty-eight hours to absolutely rib him for this. Oh, you yeah. have to. That's the oh, military yeah. code." Oh yes, yes. You get no. Someone needs to make T-shirts. I mean, it, it, this is this is this is major league. This is um, and and you got to wonder. I mean, I'm not familiar with the process involved, but my understanding is is that there's a there's a, a readership voting aspect to to this ranking, um, and so you know what it might be alluding to, which is a really good thing, is that is that Elizondo has permeated uh, a lot more minds outside of this community than we realize which is a good thing. I think your point is bang on there. It really goes to show that they are paying attention and that the mainstream uh, articles and, and magazines such as People, which is not a smut magazine like the National Enquirer or anything like oh. that, but, but it, it's usually been a reputable magazine. And for them to be able to put UFOs in that, you know, I mean, I just, it shocked me in a good way. It really did. Yes. You know, whether or not yeah. you love Elizondo or you believe Elizondo, I think John is really irrelevant at this time comparatively to the magnitude of having him in that magazine in the top 100. I, I couldn't. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, from a sociological point of view, it's a, it's a main, it's a main thread uh, crossover event. And for sure. And I, and I will say this before we change subjects here is we only got you for a couple more minutes. If there's anything more to light Dr. Stephen Greer's anger towards Lou Elizondo, it's going to be this because Elizondo has just stolen away Greer's popularity across America because of this. Oh, I had not thought of that. Now that's oh, funny. That, that is, is very that funny. Is, that's funny. Like if I'm, Lou, funny. if wow. I'm Lou, I'm calling up Dr. Steve Greer and I'm saying, hey, Steve, have you checked out who's number 68? Who's number 68, Steve? What's your number? What's your number, Steve? That's oh, what man. I would be doing. That's that's <laughs> the chir the hockey player chirping mentality that we have around here. <laughs> All right. Finally, uh, before we let you go for the night, we have um, – John Greenwald from the Black Vault, he is always very, very concise with a lot of the reporting that he does and the Freedom of Information Act information that he releases to the public, almost it seems on a daily basis. He's, he's that active about it. But recently there's been some debate because we first heard that there was a 78-page report. Then we heard it was 178 pages. We ended up, as the public, getting seven pages, nine pages, if you include the bibliography, yeah. All right? Then we heard something strange, Daniel Sheehan, the lawyer, saying that the top secret report was well over 400 pages long, but Greenwald from the Black Vault now comes... Tell us about Greenwald in this story. So basically... Um... What, what Greenwald cl claims that that he has been told by by through very official means is, is that the the briefing that the Congress got was was only about seventeen pages, and you know when you really think about it, I mean it's just let's just assume that there was a that you know that you're talking about one hundred and forty four uh, cases. How do you put one hundred and forty four cases into seventeen pages, right? I mean you're you're talking about you know two lines per per event. I mean it's it's it sounds ridiculous. However. Um, there was a point the other night uh, during Fade to Black where, where Jimmy Church texted Elizondo and, and you know, said to him, you know, Green reporting 17 pages, you know, what's up, you know? 
And uh, and Elizondo got back to him, and 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 uh, Jimmy Church read it on 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 the air, and basically, I'm I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, basically, what he said was was that the original report that he he saw uh, was in the 70 page range, but that an executive summary, which is what Congress would get, would be you know significantly less pages. So he did not endorse the 17 page claim, but he did leave an opening that. It, it might be something, you know, something that small because it would be a, um, you know, an executive summary. And what I think is interesting is if you look at the way these different numbers have been called out and what people's different perspectives are of, of numbers, you have Danny Sheehan, who probably, you know, isn't quite as as aware of the deltas between uh, OSAP and, and, and ATIP and, and the UATF uh, report. And 400 pages that he mentions actually maps better to the OSAP report that uh, Tim McMillan has confirmed is actually 400 pages. So that actually better explains what Sheehan saw. Then when it comes to to Bob McGuire, we got to remember that Bob McGuire was talking to, you know, his connections went through the National Security Council. National Security Council, I mean, you can go see who's in it. I mean, this is a this is a council run by the president of the United States. These are these are people with with significant access to national security issues, and so, you know, I think it's very possible that the seventy page report that the seventy ish page report that Elizondo uh, originally mentioned and others had mentioned that Bob then mentioned is very likely. And this is my this is you know my hypothesis is very likely the kind of document that the National Security Council would get that something like a 17 page summary of that document would be what Congress would get. And I'm sure the, the con members of Congress were, were allowed to ask for more, right? But here's the, the executive summary you're gonna get. And that what uh, what um, Danny Sheen was replying to, was referring to was actually the 400 page OSAP report. So I think you can actually explain where all these numbers come from, but wow, what a mess and, and how confusing is it for anyone that, you know, for all of us on the sidelines that are watching this and trying to figure out, you know, who's doing what and who's saying which. You got that right. John Hudson, thank you for your great first week of the unbiased UFO report. We will talk to you next week. Let's get to the news. Thank you. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky. Yeah, let's just get into it. Apparently, laughter can kill you. It is possible to die from laughing, but don't let this stop you from your favorite sitcom and giving a little chortle. Yes, people have been known to faint from laughing, which can lead to injuries. Some nar narcolepsy sufferers report temporary losses of consciousness triggered by laughter and other strong emotions. And then there are rare fatal brain conditions that can cause uncontrollable laughter as well. So make sure if you're laughing, make sure it is worth it. Nothing Bob Saget, okay, or Whoopi Goldberg, they're not funny. Ray Romano, not funny. Don't waste your laughter there. All right, here's a weird one. In uh, Elon Musk, we all know this, all right? Well... He's planning to get humans on the moon by 2024 or so, he believes. But here's where it gets a little bit weird. In 1953, a book was published that predicted the plans for an Elon to actually take humans to Mars. On December 30th, Musk quoted the popular line from Young Frankenstein on Twitter, Destiny, destiny, no escaping that for me. Despite its fictional origin, the quote is in fact referring to ideals and predestination in which the life of every human is already predetermined either by de divine design or by genetics. Quoting this on Twitter led to a little bit of a surprising revelation. Fellow Twitter user Toby Lee responded, speaking about destiny, did you know that Von Braun's 1953 book Mars Project referenced a person named Elon that would bring humans to Mars? Pretty nuts. And of course, it is right there in the print for everybody to look at, the book he is referring to is Mars Project, a technical tale written by Werner von Braun, a German-born aerospace engineer and space architect. How cool is that? 
I'm telling you, that is fantastic. We got time for one more here. Well, let's go to this one. A Nevada-born woman broke into a dentist's office, stole money, and then pulled 13 teeth from an unconscious patient on two separate occasions. According to Washoe County Police, deputies allege that Laurel Ike, who is not a dentist, broke into a dental office where she claimed she had formerly worked. She allegedly stole about $22,861 in cash and checks during the May 3 break-in. The Washoe County Police Sheriff's Office said online. Meanwhile, the tooth extraction occurred on a different date than the break-in. She also admitted to using anesthetic disposed of by the office. Oh, no, she doesn't have any troubles whatsoever, does she? Well, apparently she does. The 42-year-old was arrested, charged with two counts of burglary, one count each of grand larceny, conspiracy to commit burglary, and performing surgery on another without a medical license. I wonder if that person is getting free teeth. Thought of the day happens every night at this time where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages, then read your responses on the air. Tonight's thought of the day is tell me why you wouldn't want to run into a certain cryptid creature of your choice. Nick, dogman or bipedal canine, live in the Adirondacks, constantly hiking, and always looking out for anything out of the ordinary. But this cryptid just seems like it's straight out of hell. Muse, reptilians, I can just imagine how that would look or sound or move. Davey, dogman, imagine trying to get him back on his leash. True, Magnus, I wouldn't want to run into a dogman because I'd probably end up being a puppy chow. Lori, dogman, even, even thought I've heard it many times in the woods, go dead oppressively, hair-raising silence. Hopefully the big clan of big people have enough of them to tell them to piss off. Alex, mente tribe, because mythical naked pygmies with spears make me nervous. Josh, I mean, isn't it easier just to find out which cryptid is slower than a human and go from there? Tyler, Mothman, has always intrigued me, but I'm not sure I'd want to interact with it. And Will, I would not want to be eaten. Of course you wouldn't. Of course. Joe gets the final word. The Fresno Nightcrawler. Come on, man. Haunted MC Hammer Pants? That's terrifying. Thank you to everybody taking up and taking in the thought of the day on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you to Captain Shirk for the Newswire, John Hudson for the UFO Report, and to the Crypto Guru for joining us tonight. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms, in YouTube, LGAB, Twitch, Facebook, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I know you're out there Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. That was a great night of radio. A great night of radio. Thank you so much for such a fun night, everyone. Seriously, that was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Whoop. 
between guru time and then the UFO report and then Shirky Poo's news. Man, were we in good hands tonight. We were in really good hands. Fantastic show. That excites me. When we have nights like this, I just get like energized. Now I'm not going to be able to go to bed for a while. Seriously. Fantastic. I'm like pumped up over this. I really am. I agree with you, Grandpa. Thank you, beautiful lots. Man, that was fun. Hey, it's gorgeous Minister Elaine. Minister Elaine, you got to get back to dirty filth about getting your time so we can uh, interview you one night. That would be really cool if you could, Minister Elaine. Oh, you did email back? Cool. Why would we want you? Because you've had some experiences that we need to talk about. If you don't want to, you don't have to. You don't have to. It's up to you. It's up to you. Thanks, Polar Eclipse. Holy cow. Dandy Meyer, our guest, is sending me some images from around South Africa. My goodness. Because she lives there and that's where her business is. And, and uh, wow.
go. What did I rob? Dave's hair looks like he robbed the U.S. women's soccer team. Half of them wish they had hair as beautiful as mine. <clears throat> oh, yeah, that's a nice guitar, Paul. Yeah, just keep adding them in there, Paul. Appreciate you. Grandpa's going to get a new guitar. I want to see you play one of them 10 strings BC rich bitches. That's what I want to see. Oh, just stop already. My goodness. I think you can play it, Paul.
First week of the UFO report with John Hudson. What do you guys think of that? Even if you're not into UFOs. Hi, gorgeous Jordan Ashley Pettit. There she is. Ozzy Ange. Look how love look how beautiful that smile is on Ozzy Ange there. She loves it. Paul Holland from Australia loves it. I has, well, I mean, I think we're in the calm before the storm right now. That's my personal opinion on it. Uh, I think we really are in the calm before the storm. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens here over the next little bit. <clears throat> Mark D, what's happening, man? Look at that, Mark D. I could lend you some hair, Mark. Okay, hey guys, I'll be right back.
All right. Well, I can turn that off. Oh, uh, still not done. Of course not. Well, yeah, I think the first week went uh, pretty good at it. I really do. I think the first week went very strong with it. Um, there's enough UFO news to keep it going. It's not a full show, but there's enough. Yeah. Oh, Mark, thank you so much. I appreciate that, man. Appreciate that. Applesauce, how are you? I promise you I'll grab myself a beer uh, tomorrow. Uh, Minister Elaine, PBR is great. He was in a couple times this week, and uh, that was kind of cool. I like PBR. Me two seconds here, people. Started. Minister Lane, let's go riding. Let's go riding, Minister Lane. <clears throat> My Arctic cat is ready to go.
All right. When it cools down, when it cools down, then we'll go. Thurston Howell the third. How are you? Oh, 52 degrees. I am sorry. I went on Celsius on that. Oh yeah. 52 degrees. You could totally go riding in that. That's nice weather to go riding in. Nothing but a hoodie and sweatpants. Where is home, Minister Elaine? I know you're in Nevada right now, but where is home originally? German Texas. Oh, I want to go to Texas. Now I got to look at the Texas map. Where on the Texas map is German Texas? Hold on, I'll find it. Hey, okay, there it is. Oh, it's northwest of Dallas. Got it. Good night, Alaska's greatest athlete. Bob Gray, what's happening? Have a great afternoon there, Ozzy Ange. Who's Kyle? We are filling up August right now, so if you have any guest suggestions, get them to Emily at info at spacedoutradio.com or to Dirty Filth at bookings at spacedoutradio.com.
this in here. Don't forget, Lynn Wallington tomorrow night, Michael W. Hall on Sunday as we continue the programming here on the Spaced Out Radio YouTube channel. Uh, no, never had David Hike, never will. Uh, I don't buy into a lot of the conspiracies that he peddles, and I'm not interested in taking uh, our show down that road. Ross Coldheart will be a guest on this show on, um, let me find out for you, July 29th. All done. Tomorrow night on the show, Lynn Wallington will have Carlene, regressive hypnotherapy and energy healer. Yes, that's tomorrow night on the show. Sunday night, Michael W. Hall will have uh, John and Emily Goodwin. And we will uh, have a great weekend of uh, shows for you. I come in on Monday with Max Hawthorne talking marine cryptids. That's going to be absolutely awesome. I look forward to that one. We're going to have another good week. 
We got uh, John Sumple coming in for Extraordinary the uh, Revelations. He's a documentarian. We got Merle on Wednesday, Varla Ventura, followed with Jim Goodall on Friday night. We are in for another power week of shows, people, here on the mighty SOR. Thank you, everyone uh, who's donated to Super Chats this week, including tonight. We got Mark, Lott, Kat, Andrew, Michael, Ed, Michael again, Betty, Fabster, Snakes, Andrew, Murray, and Michael again. We really do appreciate the love and support of Spaced Out Radio. And uh, I'll give you my imitation of Fap before we go. Hi, I'm Fap. Hi, I'm Fap. I'm Fap. Look at my head bobble. And uh, you guys have an awesome and amazing weekend. Much, much love to each and every one of you. And uh, have a safe weekend. Enjoy Lynn. Enjoy Michael. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in the chat rooms tomorrow night. I'll probably be here doing the website, but uh, stay cool, stay awesome. I'll keep you in touch with the fire, forest fire situation here as well. Hey, hey 405er, how you doing? And uh, we'll have uh, a great weekend. And we'll see you all on Monday. Mark, again, thank you so much for another amazing super chat. Really do appreciate that, man. Thank you, guys. You take care. Have a great week. Good night.